I met a gypsy. This is tech. Yeah, yeah we're on, mate. You we, gotta, don't, we don't do things by halves at Euro. You know your shit. All right, so Julian Wilson, welcome to Gypsy Tales, mate. I am uh, pretty excited to have maybe the world's biggest moto fan surf frother. You're, actually, this is the way to say it. You're the best surfer in the world that likes motocross. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> There's not many of us, to be honest. I mean, Sonny Garcia, he was probably the best. He's won a world title and um, massive fan of motocross. Um, but yeah, I'm stoked to be on the show. Big fan of the show. No, that's awesome. Yeah, I um, I got a random DM from you a while ago. And I've been a Julian Wilson fan for years. And when I first started the podcast, actually, because um, I know Bart um, from Wasserman. And I said to Bart, I was like, one day I'd be sick to get Julian on. So stars have aligned. But yeah, I got the message and I was like, dude, Julian is a uh, full moto frother. So I was pretty stoked on that. Yeah, it's um, just been, I mean, uh, anyone that's ridden a dirt bike, it's it's in your blood. You either have it or you don't. I never talk a friend into it, never bring it up to people that don't talk, don't ride. Um, but when I connect with the boys that ride and um, the friends that I grew up with riding bikes and rode professionally and stuff, like some of my best memories growing up. Yeah, what got you into riding motocross and how, how long has it been in your life? um well i wanted it to start a lot earlier than it did um my best mate uh lived just down the road he had a peewee 50 um and i would have been maybe seven eight when i first had to go yeah and from that moment it was kind of like how do i get my own bike like i just want to ride like when's my mate gonna ride next time like when can we ride when can we ride we used to ride in the block on the block next door to my parents house across the road from the beach at Coolum, um just cutting laps of the paddock it was it was so much fun um but I got it because my dad he loved bikes um he rode trail bikes and he rode Ducatis in particular road bikes for probably about 15 years of his life right up until pretty much I was born because um I'm the youngest of three, um, so I was the final one, and yeah, there wasn't really the funds left once the third third baby came along to still um, to keep his bike. So it's funny, like my two older brothers could not give a shit about riding a bike. You know, they're petrified of bikes. Can't really say they've ever understood why I ride a bike, yeah. um, but I've just got it from dad, and like it's just one of those things that i've tried to deny it and think that it's not that meaningful to me yeah. but when i neglect it like i think a part of me kind of suffers it's like well there's nothing more pure than going and opening the throttle on a dirt bike and like smiling and and having fun with your mates and the the respect that you have between each other like who you're riding with and like what risk you're taking and the and like the friends I grew up riding with like some were really good and would win the club days and um like state champions and stuff but still like they were obviously just going to school and they weren't getting any great funding or anything and now a lot of the friends that I ride with they work all week and ride for pleasure on the weekend like no one wants to eat shit and like yeah. take time off and and not be fully able and to enjoy life but like there's just something about riding a dirt bike that is like instant freedom and happiness that can't be neglected if it's something that you're passionate about it's funny man so me and jack have been doing jiu-jitsu here the whole time and jack's in a very similar position with jiu-jitsu and you guys are both surfers and there's a lot of people <laughs> that are in that kind of position of their professional athlete in a certain sport but there's just these other callings that really kind of speak to them and then you've got to have this internal battle of oh fuck i really shouldn't be doing this in terms of my my work because you know you're one of only 32 professional surfers on the world tour so that that must be a pretty hard line for you to walk yeah well um it's funny like the times that i've neglected it and and 
and taken a step back from it have probably been the times that I've found it hardest to get my best performances mm. because I feel like I'm giving up things that I love doing that make my character who I am and 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 what makes me 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 um, by neglecting something like that which has such a plays such a big role. Um, I then like try and find that in other places and like whether it's like you know waves of consequence like gets that similar feeling um like you know winning an event to like make it feel like neglecting something that I love and I'm passionate about is worth it yeah but at the end of the day like those are kind of shallow um feelings like it's it's, it's they're very brief too. they're very brief and obviously uh, you you sacrifice a lot um to chase your dreams and like i feel like i've i've sacrificed a lot to to get where i am and um i just think like you can't sacrifice everything mm. um like yeah for sure sacrifice like you know a good education um childhood friendships um like my family's been incredible my whole career but definitely sacrificed big parts of that missed out on a lot of stuff been traveling on the road since like on my own like 15 i started going overseas on my own mm. um missing massive amounts of school um but you get to a point where like you got to feed the beast you got to yeah. like make yourself feel whole and make it felt make yourself feel like you are taking control of yourself and like you're in line with the things that that make you happy and like i want to work hard to be fit to perform at my best and then like i don't you know go and party hard i yeah. never have um i've had a bit of fun but like for me to go and like spend a day out in the bush with my mates riding a dirt bike like that one day like partying whatever like nothing even compares to the feeling that i get of freedom of like expressing myself and being in a with a helmet on and sort of just being you know yeah just being myself and and expressing myself like however i want to i've always like you know when you're on a dirt bike you have full control of what risk you take yeah um and how willing you are and what you're looking to get out of riding a bike um are you doing it for just pure fun and like freedom are you looking to do it to push the limits and like get better and like mm. are you trying to um you know really influence the curve of progression or are you just like happy you know riding once a month and being happy with where your level's at and lasting four laps of a motocross yeah. track and then sitting back and having a beer with the boys <laughs> take your helmet off and shoot the shit and talk about the track and just be immersed in in riding a bike for the day um is yeah it's it's uh it's been so much fun um and i've just yeah i've, I've never fully sort of uh let it go and it's something that i'll do forever and i um now having two kids and i'm sure there'll be you know, a state, a point where they're going to, the they're going to, going to want to have a go. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I just think it's, it makes, it's a big part of making up who I am. Yeah. Um, and it's just, yeah, it's a lot of fun. I love that you can identify that it's something that is kind of like intrinsic and that you do need, because I feel like a lot of people, you, you get met with a certain level of resistance for something and then you're like, okay, too hard basket. I got this and I got work and I got blah, 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 blah. But you've really like nailed down that this is a thing that's important to you and you've actively kind of worked towards making it happen even though there's kind of a lot of reasons or like factors against it. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the the commitment to perform for endorse for your sponsors for yourself for your lifelong goals of um achieving what you want to achieve like that all is 
is held in such high regard that when you challenge that with something that doesn't necessarily mesh in the same environment and make sense to even like my brothers and the yeah, people closest yeah. to me, but yeah. like talk to mom or talk to dad about it, dude, like they're like, just go, have, have fun. Like it's what you've always done. Like don't think about it. Just, you know, they've always trusted my ability to, to, to judge my risk. Yeah. Um, I've always skateboarded and rode motorbikes and dug holes and built BMX tracks like across the road from home and always just been taking risk my whole life. And, um, but yeah, it's, it's like, I'm a pretty, I do like to control like my risks. Yeah. Like I love putting myself in an environment where it's like, shit, like, can I back myself to make the right decision? Like, is my head screwed on? Like what happens when, like the adrenaline takes over the brain and should I jump what, the triple? Should I what, not jump the triple? Yeah. What, what decisions am I going to make when it comes to the crunch? Um, but I've taken a lot from that because you hop on a dirt bike, you're instantly in that environment. Like yeah. we get to experience it coming from Australia, being on tour for 10 years, like there's Fiji gets a big swell. There's yeah. ways of consequence. Pipe. Tahiti yeah. pipe. Um, and they're the only times that like could with the with the tour schedule like you're not at those locations aside from for the events so like you go from the sunshine coast like in summer and you surf in two foot waves you got three weeks to prepare to go to tahiti and there's a 12 foot swell that's going to meet you on the first day of the event i just go well like i've got something in my back pocket that mm. creates an environment that I'm going to be walking into off like not surfing ways like that since December in Hawaii. It's like I go and ride my bike more. I'll ride it three times a week. I'll get familiar in that environment. Being I'm probably, comfortable and being uncomfortable. Exactly. And, and trusting my judgment like in fear and under, under the pump um, and backing myself and creating a bit of familiar familiarity in that um and i feel like it expands my my comfort level to go and just have a crack and like back myself and that makes sense and, man. and stick my my um my head over the ledge and have a go like i don't know it's just something that i've taken as an advantage yeah. and something that i have that i can utilize um sunshine coast is not known for great waves especially not consistently um, so I think I've always been creative, um, in how I use my time and where I put my energy and yeah. what makes me who I am. I think I'm pretty unpredictable and I feel like I have a lot to, to bring to the table when I can, when I can bring out my best performances and stuff. Um, and I think that I value that yeah like i don't i try not to be too predictable and i feel like those um outside of competition and surfing career activities create that unpredictability yeah. that i have and and yeah my character and what i'm passionate about and what's meaningful to me yeah um but can, yeah. can there be like a point of diminishing returns if you just focus on surfing too much? Absolutely. I've, I've been there like several times, um, especially like, you know, you, you think about you're spending nine months of the year on the road competing and trying to be peaking for each event. You surf yeah. 11 events, you want to peak each two week window that you have um consistently for that period of time there's like you get from i mean the schedule's changed now but like you would get from coming home from hawaii in december you get to prepare for the gold coast end of feb start of march and that was like your big training block um and then you kind of maintain that energy and physical prep to to perform at your best you know for the year and you get another little block in the middle of the year between jay bay and tahiti yeah um and like when you're on the road and you are away from family and friends and 
you can be out of an event like on the first day yeah. um, and you spend in large amounts of time thinking about what needs to be done, um, how to approach the next one, how to how to be at your best. Like you're spending so much time like in a vulnerable space mm. where it's like, you know, you definitely think about what sacrifices you're giving up to chase some, like for myself, like something that isn't of the same value as like my like love for my family mm. and like my connections that I have with with my family and friends and um, it's like it, it's it's just like I don't know I've, I feel like the more that I would chase it and think oh I'll block this out block that mm. out sacrifice this keep sacrificing more of that like um, the less I would have to give like it was almost like mm. I was robbing myself to try and get the best out of myself um, and that happened a lot like early in my career and I felt like I had some real highs but some real like long lows mm. of events and there and really, this really wasn't constantly. a yeah there, there wasn't a balance and um, and I think too like trying to find a belief that like I was belonged to be there and yeah yeah I had some some uh, some great results and ones that said you know yeah you you deserve to be here and you made the final or you've won your first event but like to consistently show up at each event for nine months of the year um and you want to be peaking um it takes it takes balance yeah it takes um you know for myself I want to do it with my family in my back pocket yeah, like it's yeah. what's it, it's what holds the weight and what has what got me to the opportunity of competing on the highest level and something that I've never neglected and um it's because you kind of can you can sell your soul a bit eh like you can be one of those people like you look at um like a Kelly Slater or someone like that that's just all in 100% they did it for so long and probably did push away so many parts of his life that I'm sure he would have liked it and obviously speaking for him hypothetically but I think it's a common theme with some athletes is like you just give away all those sacrifices um, or you make all those sacrifices and it's like the ultimate sacrifice but you're delivered with extreme success in the field that you are chasing you know yeah but that comes at the cost of obviously the things that you sacrifice and maybe a bit of personal fulfillment yeah i think i've always thought about at the end of the day like perspective was always very clear for me like just being fit able healthy Mm. the opportunity the the lifestyle was just is had it just is is such a special thing um so i don't i've never taken it for granted in any way um i think i've always found it hard to go okay well like all of this makes up like where i'm at right now Mm. like why do i sort of deserve to like then go oh this isn't enough Mm. like i need that world title and i need it like now Mm. and like i'm not satisfied where i am for sure like I'm not satisfied with where I am in my career right now. Like I, I feel like my my best performances and and my best is yet to come. And like that's super exciting for me. But you know I have a beautiful young family, beautiful wife, so much to be thankful for. And when I think about at the end of my career, the things that I'm going to be most proud of mm. is definitely my family, my relationship with my wife, um, that's what I'm going to take with me forever forward after this career. Um, but ha- can I hold that in such high regard and also match it with a world title? I mm. really think I can. I've been super close. Um, 
and like in 2018 I was three heats away from came to the last heat of the year to decide the world title um it's probably the greatest year of my life um had my first child started that Mm. year had like the most like radical change up in my program and like so much less control but like so much more came in of of love and joy and um having it having our first our first child um and then to win multiple events and make four finals and come runner up in the world it was kind of like there was only something so small that Mm. didn't quite happen there that stopped like the ultimate from happening for me which was a world title yeah um so since then um it's about finding that balance again um i've got there without the family uh like without having kids um pretty consistently and then had my best year ever after having my first child and now things have gone array with COVID and complications yeah. and everything and and having this time off and and now it's like getting back into the swing of things and um showing up with my best performances again like that's where my head is at and I'm not there at the moment um but I believe I can get there pretty soon and I'm really close um but yeah, in what we were saying, what you were saying is like at the end of at the end of my career, like I just want like I already say thank you to surfing yeah, and to yeah. like traveling the world and to my family for bringing me up the way they did to appreciate the things that I do um, and the things that I I see and and acknowledge on my travels and um, the appreciation that I have. Like I, you know, you see some. You see, you know, athletes from all around the world um, and their sacrifices that they're making and sometimes, like, you see, you know, it's never enough. Mm. Um, and, and yeah, it's, it, it, it's hard to see. It's hard to watch sometimes. Um, but, like, yeah, I think... I don't know. I just, I really want to win a world title. I'm, you know, a world title is never going to be of the same level of, of having kids and, you know, creating a family. I think that's going to be the most proud thing I'll ever have in my life. Um, but like, for the amount of work that I've put yeah, in to get yeah. to the position where I'm at now and what yeah. I think I'm capable of achieving and the time that I have left to do it, like it's still just like, it's super motivating. It's it's what like I will continue to make sacrifices for and it's the, the number one thing that I make sacrifices for as soon as I come back from, you know, my wife and my two kids it, and then it's surfing. Um, and there's room for that and traveling at the moment with my family we're about to go to western australia for two more events um it's like yeah i'm gonna start winning events and i've got room i've got room for it and my family supports it and for as long as it goes that way i'm gonna put my head down bum up and like i want to win a world title in the way that i know i can that i'm and in a way that i'm proud of yeah yeah for sure um and and that's just the way that I look at it. Um, are you looking at like you're a, you're a fan of, <coughs> of motocross in a massive way? Like you're watching every heat race, you're watching every LCQ, you're watching every main. You're plugged into what's going on. Are those boys a source of inspiration for you? Because it'd be it'd be weird at your level because you're sort of not really looking at your peers for inspiration. I'm sure because the guys that are on your level you're head to head with them each weekend in a world title race so is is that another thing that draws you in so much is like you can be a real fan you can relate to what those boys are doing on the motorcycle and you can really like draw inspiration from those dudes in your own kind of way 
because you are going through such similar things like there's huge sacrifices in moto in the same way that there's surfing in every other professional sport uh yes definitely um i mean in saying that the guys that i've been competing against and especially the guys in the top top five of the, of the last five years um i definitely do enjoy being a fan of like where their mm. level is at and taking things that are that i see that consistent sort of themes that really work for those guys and and definitely try and work on those in in my in my game but like i think that to ride a dirt bike i think it's probably the gnarliest athletes in the world um the the scheduling to yeah. to be backing up these supercross races straight into outdoors um to be running at that level they need to be at that consistency i mean the amount of risk and like training um the combination of things that have to come together to to win a supercross or an outdoors like I mean, I understand why their sh careers are, are short. Mm. Like they are being, there's a huge ask on those guys to be peaking for such a, a long period of time in such high adrenaline, like such high cardio. Like um, I can't fathom like the way that they have to like put everything into a weekend and then like, maybe chill out on a monday but then back taking mm. like massive risk on a tuesday and then preparing for another peak like it's like i don't know and their tr their training is just brutal like <laughs> they have to be so fit yeah and if they're not the fittest or one of the top three fittest guys on the track they're not going to contend for a championship yeah like the the competition never ends for those guys. Like there's no denying the fact that they have to be the one of the fittest guys on the track, let alone like their ability to ride a bike and how much out, how many hours they put into riding a bike and how natural everything comes to them. And like it, it, I mean, and then the bike balance and the mechanic and the relationships yeah. and the group and like these guys are, the most badass badass athletes in the world like there's no denying that the amount of risk that has to be taken the amount of focus the amount of sacrifice the like willingness to just sack up and have a crack like you know weekend after weekend or at the moment three times a week like um i have so much respect for those guys and i am a massive fan of watching it and i take huge inspiration off like watching their work ethic and how they navigate mm. dealing with a sport of such consequence and like you know like just practicing before a race weekend and like being in a championship battle and like you know it's a motorbike and it's a and it's a track and like smallest mistake and then you're kind of missing out on a huge opportunity and then mm. even when the even like i've had my fair share of injuries but like you know to get back to the level you need to be at to compete surfing and and make heats and like get back into yeah, the swing of things yeah. is like you know i've won heats at six i've won an event at 65 percent of my physical ability really? like basically like an arm that would not get me through a heat like a, an injury and but there's a way where like like there's a way around yeah it. you can read the ocean you can be on the right wave your timing can be really good you can be synced up like you can be making good decisions you can outsmart your competitor but like when you have a pack of freaking hornets like buzzing all over you and your cardio is not at its peak and like you've got an injury and you can't hang on you're not there like you're not even going to be in the top 10 like yeah it's so when they do take an injury they might be in a title championship battle 
like by the time they get back to another being in that position again like it's a year or so Mm. and like for those guys that's like maybe missing a whole season outdoors or missing a whole season supercross and then like yeah and then you're looking at contracts and contracts and bot and where you if you got a seat and limited bikes and like limited amount of years that you have in your prime and well the value that the the big brands see in you and as soon as they don't like if you're not on a factory bike you're not competing for a championship like you might still be one of the very best yeah but you're not on a factory bike with a factory team you're ruled out of a championship so like then you're you're your physical like ability and your talent and and what you've created to compete for a championship when you were on a factory bike that factory bike is gone Mm. it doesn't matter how good you are you're not gonna be there like so if you're that good why would you continue that's why like yeah these guys retire when they do it's like well your factory ride's gonna be up next year okay i'm 28 and you know i'm yeah i've just had one poor year i probably had a couple of back-to-back niggling injuries that have held me off from from fighting for a championship but i'm not going to have a factory seat you know that they probably know that they're not going to get a factory ride again Mm. you know a year after that once they've been bumped out of there once they get to like 30 29 like yeah it's just such a it's a it's just a gnarly sport and like as a fan it creates like this like super intense like you know this this vibe it's like holy shit like if you're not on the top of your game like you're getting bumped out like there's so much talent there like look at the 450s this year like it's been psycho this year psycho the ebbs and flows and like to see plessinger come back and like be challenging again and like obviously that the changes that they've made to that yamaha is like night and day obviously yeah it's been incredible which has made it even more exciting again to see the yamaha up there in the 450s but Um, he's a good example because if he didn't do good this year done and then you might end up at a second tier team and then that might last two years and then you're back coaching (laughs) or you know what i mean and and then there's not even (coughs) there's not even like a a second place you can go like there's no other series there's no you know there's no like minor leagues you're either winning and you're on a factory bike and contending for a championship or you're sort of not really doing anything yeah and even though you might have the ability exactly it's brutal like i mean the formula one is like the pinnacle of that like there's yeah 20 seats only 20 seats and like sebastian vettel right now like he still loves to drive and he's still driving, but like he's not going to be anywhere near a podium, like unless an absolute miracle happens. Mm. But like. Well, Alonso is the same. He's like, that people say Alonso is like one of the best drivers. Yeah. But Nowhere. he's got to accept the yeah. fact that he's not going to be there. Um, but they still get the opportunity like they they still see the the purpose in being there and their love for driving for sure yeah. but like when you're coming out off the back of like a super uh, a motocross career with the amount of risk that you're taking without any protection around you mm. and like the amount of like back-to-back seasons the amount of races that you got to show up for like the sacrifice like so hard to like have so much respect for the privateers like Mm. backing themselves in like putting money on the table to go and then like risk it all and to know that they're not even going to finish in the top 10 maybe not even make the main not even make the main and then like they are just warriors Mm. like but i'm kind of like a bit sick and twisted in the same way like that like i just want to go like i Contest just finished here at Narrabeen. Like, I'd love to go. Should ride, we, can we ride? Ride my dirt bike tomorrow. Ride tomorrow? Seriously, I got my my bike is getting suspension done at the moment for the first time. Um, Will it be back for tomorrow? Oh, if we drove up to Newcastle, we probably could go well, let's for just a go ride. Yeah, let's just go right <laughs> up at Newcastle. I know. I just reset. Um, but 
yeah, you just, you know, they just yeah. Like, there's just something to, about it, eh? To go and ride that track and to be on the track with the, yeah. the the best guys and to like match yourself up in some way and appreciate how they're riding and you getting to like just cut laps on that track and like be a part of the whole show is like like is worth the risk for these yeah. guys. Like, what's well, one of the cool things that um, has come out of the Gypsy Tales thing is that. I feel like it's it's been really fun to have a platform that you can kind of have dudes that they're not really they're not even in the main events, but the content's like worth watching. Yeah, and you know a guy like AJ, AJ Catanzara, yeah. you know dudes like that, or Jeff Walker. I mean, that's been really cool. Um, and I feel like now with the more internet-based platforms and people starting their own stuff, I feel like we're going to move in a direction where people are celebrated in a different way like there's more people that um will have access to those kind of not everyone's got access to roxon and web and that sort of stuff but there is now some cool content that's starting to get made and and i hope that it ends up being like uh have, have you watched drive to survive at all yeah so you see a dude like uh like roman grosjean get six yeah. and they're just like losing their shit like the team's fist bumping and high-fiving and jumping over the pit wall because there's an acknowledgement within the sport of just how hard that is like mm -hmm. that story's been told yeah. and i think that in moto it's one of those um the conversations only ever just been around the podium and then when you do that it's like there's only three dudes a week that we're or six dudes a week that we're pumped on yeah but there's 40 guys that raced and yeah. it's like fuck there's like a whole lot of people that are just like completely left out of the conversation so yeah. i actually think that i think it is going to change quite soon in terms of you might not make night shows or you might not be in the championship or but i think slowly there's this new acknowledgement and appreciation for those guys like yeah the lcq i mean i'm kind of a uh i'm kind of a uh protagonist here of saying like fuck the lcqs yeah. because i just get bored of watching supercross for three hours but unless jason i'm wrong and, unless jason Anderson's unless being wiped out yeah. and then just comes fighting back yeah as i say that too the lcqs have actually been pretty lit this year but that's the attitude that needs to be adopted like every race is rad every dude that's in even the top 10 should be you know like every dude that's in the top 10 of a supercross should be fist pumping over the finish line because yeah. it's like you just did something not many people on planet earth can do as opposed to seventh being like a dog shit result you know yeah but i think that that will get better um and i think that that's gonna be like a pretty good thing for the sport going forward you know absolutely i mean storytelling is like the coolest part of sport yeah i think and drives to survive is a prime example of that like my wife like couldn't care less to watch a formula one race or understand like even what what colored car is connected to what manufacturer like yeah. she could not care but yeah. like you put drive to survive on and we're watching three episodes in a row yeah and she's like what let's like are we watching drive to survive not like Shit. Yes. yeah they, we're doing it and like and then it's like you know and then the next first race of the season pops up and it's like oh she knows the name she knows yeah. like the stories she's like fuck you know feeling for one guy stoked for another guy that normally it's just like oh who was first second and third yeah but then all of a sudden it's like oh who got the better of like that group of cars and then like that yeah. and then like you know that poor guy that went from that seat to that seat and is trying to get back to that seat you know that's like it builds it out it it gives it the the volume and um just to let people into the like the sacrifice that they're making and the mm. commitment they're making and the opportunity the opportunity that they're trying to create for themselves and like their goals and ambitions like letting the public know what they are yeah as opposed to like the public having their preconceived like just assuming that it's only first it's, place it's yeah, only yeah, about yeah. the podium yeah, like yeah you might i don't know like ryan dungey as a junior like coming through the juniors like getting to the supercross and riding a 250 like 
he wasn't winning anything and yeah. like his like story like at that point in his career like to take that story from there to like where his career yeah, ended to a hall of is fame, like right? that's that's a that's a that's a story that's one that like you until he was winning and like obviously that's how he where he needed to get to 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 make the story what it ended up being yeah but that's like, the bookend of this yeah but the drive and motivation and grit and hunger and like fuck these guys i'm gonna make this happen like yeah i'm not getting the support like ac and you know the guys that just are winning it super talent um mm. and dominating and may ha have the body build to like really have an advantage at that younger age and like some sort of mental edge with how they were brought up and stuff like mm. but when like the big show comes and like someone just works their way up the ladder and just ends up like being so clinical and like so just tack sharp and it, able to like you know it was almost like he kind of changed the game even i mean look at webb right now like mm. it's just like kind of fuck the style like don't worry about any judgment of like you know getting the like fan base or like you know hanging it out there to like you know think that's what people want to see to mm. for you to you know like have your value it's like no like checkered flag first that's it like mm. i want to win the championship like do whatever it takes like i don't know if i ever saw ryan dungey do a tail whip <laughs> at all i never saw the bike move but like his consistency is admirable and his like results uh from a just you know yeah hall of fame sort of results like it's incredible especially like i mean jeremy mcgrath and ricky carmichael just like and chad reed and like i mean jeremy and ricky to dominate the, the way they did and the amount of wins that they had and same in surfing like slater had has won so many world titles but like no offense to to kelly but like i just think that at the moment like there's not room like in just about any sport i mean Lewis Hamilton. Yeah, he's getting for it done. sure. He's getting it done, and he and he is he he has that monopoly on the F one at the that's moment. That's a but mi that's a mix between like the best car and an amazing driver yeah. and team, and you know like that's a that's yeah. a bit of a unicorn kind yeah. of mix. Yeah, and that is one that's hard to look at and say that's just a yeah. hundred percent yeah. Lewis Hamilton's ability and drive to win, and like he's making that happen because like you take him and put him in you know an Alfa an, Romeo or another car and then all of a sudden you know but um it's yeah it's it's like maybe it's because of the internet I think it is like especially social media and like the competitiveness from a super young age to be at a level of like someone on the other side mm. of the world and be like matching yourself to that level and not just like seeing a video or something mm. like you know once a year that goes oh there's a super that's from like last year or whatever grom it from somewhere yeah. and um it's like the level's at the highest it's it's ever been and like i don't know you look at the supercross right now i don't know has there ever been a time that there's been more championship winners in a 450 class battling for a championship no like that speaks volumes of like yeah. where the world's at and it also speaks volumes then that once you know that and you get to round 15 and there's only two dudes left in it that also speaks to how gnarly those two dudes are as well and that that there's some like crazy war of attrition that goes on as well to stay in the fight for for that long and it's just like you throw there's so many variables there's so many stuff that these guys get thrown at them and then there's two dudes that can rise to the top it's like they must just be the two dudes that have mentally been able to weather the storm for as long as they have you know yeah most definitely is that what you think it is i think it is i think like those those 
two guys that are fighting for this championship right now have the most energy like to put into each race Mm -hmm. like they you could say like they both want it the most and that's why they're there um like Eli Tomac is just can be so dominant and like so lethal once he gets on a roll but like you know he finally won his Supercross championship and Mm. like Kenny wants that 450 championship more than anything in the world and for someone to like come from the depths of where he came from to like to even be in this conversation like I know that people have like had have said this about Kenny several times even last year when it was like he he was winning again it was like he you know until he actually won a race it was like yeah you wouldn't expect him to even like be there because you you've been a part of the journey of like watching just how gnarly it is what he has gone through and then like for this year to have multiple wins to be like you know hats off to kenny because he's riding his own race Mm. like he you know Cooper loves mind games and talks about it a lot and like he's like I've got the edge on everyone and you know that's that's my thing and that's how I get under people's skin like I think Kenny's clearly the only one that doesn't give a shit about that because he's the one that's still there Mm. battling for this championship like yeah he's Cooper's got the best of of everyone at the moment he is winning the championship but Kenny's the next one in line and Kenny's like mate I've been to the darkest place like whatever you have to say to me like say it mm. give, give, give a shit i've got all these years of hard work put into like wanting this championship and like whatever you have to say is like is nowhere near as gnarly as what i've been through and my and and to go through having his first child as well on top of like coming back from the injuries um he's probably the strongest mentally he's ever been in his career i Mm. mean you always have to say like physically he's never gonna be back to where he was before what happened it's like you know michael jordan like didn't break his legs and Mm. then come back and like dominate basketball golf yeah tiger woods um like to to have those those injuries and i mean like just to be able to ride the bike at that level and to be showing up and fighting for the championship and like i know it's probably the last thing he wants to like hear it's like i don't want to just be fighting for it like yeah i I want to win the damn thing like more than anything and like but like he's got probably one of the most incredible comeback stories in sport in sport and i mean i'll go out on a limb and say it doesn't need a supercross championship to appreciate Mm. and respect where he's got himself back to but for him it's like he's he wants that tick of approval like yeah i've i've been to the darkest place i'm back i can win races i can battle um, and I can I can win this championship, and I think if he doesn't get it this year, he's like, if you go from last year to this year, mm. you know, if he doesn't get it this year, like next year, the hunger isn't going anywhere. You know, he's going to show up, he's going to do the same badass shit on his bike, and he's going to win races, and he's going to win a couple more, and he's going to win a championship. If he wins it this year, you know. It might be something where, like, he's been on this huge sto- this this huge journey mm. from from his injuries to back to this level and and having a child and kind of goes, you know, like a huge sort of weight, off weight his might be off yeah. his shoulders. Which I think we saw um, we saw that with Tomac too. You know what I mean? Like, it's just been this massive weight that he's been carrying around forever. And it's like, you get it. And I mean, the competitor in a person would be like, well, two is better than one, but it's like, fuck, not really. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. 
I mean, you've hit the you've hit the highest peak. Actually, I'm just gonna uh, put that. Away. Yeah, I think she, she started getting a little low. A bit low? Yeah. Oh, that sounds different. Um, yeah, you can hear it way more, eh? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, sorry, Eli. Eli, yeah. I think super... I mean, whatever I have to say, take it as a grain of salt. Oh, I'm just bro, a surfer hey, I'm and I'm same. just a fan of the sport. <laughs> and, same. like, don't take me... Um, <laughs> yeah. too seriously I just I hey, love watching the races that's also all of Gypsy Tales and I only <laughs> yeah this is just my point of view and um, but like I don't know I see it as like outdoors comes really naturally to Eli and then Supercross is like he gets on these incredible roles where he's just untouchable but then like it's so technical and tight that when he tightens up one of those mistakes that he makes like little mistakes that he would never normally make in any other circumstances mm. they they get compounded by more and then like all of a sudden like a championship is like out of his hands and mm. it's like and i think it's only from my point of view like the fact that it's tight racing and it's not wide open and it's not like you know his cardio and his ability to fight to the end is like that's one of his is, things is outdoors yeah. and it's like you'll grind it out and um and he'll take on the nastiest track and he'll just like mm. manhandle it but when things get like you know he gets a, a good lead in the supercross and then like a couple technical sections he gets a little bit wrong and then he like all of a sudden you just see him falling in the most like randomest spots and you're like oh no he's having an, another moment sort yeah. of thing i think for him to like you know hats off to him for like shaking that off and and staying in it and then winning the championship um in supercross to like round out yeah just how incredible his career is and i mean he could show up next year and win supercross again no yeah, worries like you right. know and he's won he's won events this year and like i don't know i've been loving watching these races like at atlanta you know these like they're like twice the size of yeah. a regular supercross track and the boys are getting to hang it out there a lot more and I like even just to like watch it and like the follow cam through some of the rhythm sections and them just hanging it on and like getting the I don't know it's just sick I love it but um it is pretty suited to Tomac at the moment I just mm. he, I just it looks like he doesn't have the mongrel yeah. this year um well at what point is there like so you've been real close in world title races so if you can can because I think there's parallels in surfing in terms of it's a really long season. It's really grueling. And so you got an event, but then you've got all these heat races within an event. So like you guys have to win this tournament style of um, events. So there's just constant events within events, within events, within events. Mm -hmm. And it's just such a long process that you guys have to go through. You've got to be so sharp for so long. And if you make a mistake, you know, like early on you're out, then you deal with the big points deficit and then you have another one of those again in a row. And then you that championship, it's almost like at the start of the year, it's right there. That trophy's right in front of you and there's the same distance between you and it as every other competitor. Mm -hmm. And then slowly that world title trophy gets further and further away if you're not having a great season. But two results in a row can get you right back in it. But how hard is it when it's not going your way and when you do have these events like for me turning point with uh eli for this season was him and basha crashing with freeze like that really affected the championship that's sort of the point where he essentially kind of like dipped out of it you know and same with basha um but yeah like how hard is it to just like keep the belief keep the hunger keep the motivation when you get those setbacks and on paper it looks like you're out of it mm -hmm. i think yeah i think uh like at the at the top level it's when a thing that i think happens at the top level when you when things aren't going your way like 
you it's definitely how you you handle your losses is is how you you create your consistency and like Mm. showing up at the next one and how how you handle that is far more important than how you handle winning an event Mm. um or winning a race um but i think sometimes like i'm just speaking for myself like i don't sacrifice like my family I don't sacrifice like my wife and my kids for for anything um and like when I dip out of an event early like I sometimes I take it really hard because like I'm like I I factor in like the the sacrifice of my family and what I'm putting them through and like, Mm. and having them there. And like, I, I wear that and I'll always will wear that, but I would value having them with me over, over it anyway. And Mm. if if that's the way it was, like I just, it is what it is, is is. but sometimes guys are set up in their careers and, and in their lives where like, it's their everything. Yeah. And like when they, you know, they have a really good consistency of showing up at their best because that's their everything. And they're so in control of their routine at that point. If there's no kids and no wife or or you've got a wife, but there's no kids in the program. So she's letting you be super selfish. Um, yeah, like they, they have more control over their schedule, but like your kids when they're two and four running around carrying on, like they don't have any perspective of what you need to do to be prepared for a comp yeah exactly um and like there's value in that for me um and and the ability to to switch off from events during events when i need to Mm. um and and balancing that like definitely there's advantages advantages to that for me and and i'm still working on like how that best works for sure yeah um but when you're like I think when you're at the top level and you're looking for that consistency, like sometimes when you have those, that, that tunnel focus and like you, you, you don't get the result you're looking for, but like, it's like, okay, well, like nothing else needs to change. Mm. I'm just going to keep plugging away because this is my whole world. And like, this is, this is it. Like, you know, that the event didn't go my way, but like, there's not a lot else that I could change. Mm. Um, and then like just being, um, just being there for, for, for you, um, is, is what it is, what it takes is like just backing yourself in. Mm. Um, and everyone's human and, and they want to like enjoy, um, where they're at and, guys and girls are all at different stages in their lives when certain results happen and stuff but i think when it comes to consistency at the highest level it's like just i mean i haven't cracked the code but there's definitely times where like you know you need to take care of of everything you can you can to set yourself up for like being willing to fail and and mm. and dip out of an event by taking big risk and trying to surf the way you want to or like ride the way you want to and like applying yourself 100 percent to that moment um you learn a lot when things don't go right because it's like okay well like it feels this way because like i've got certain things in in certain places that are really sort of either going against what i'm going for or like you know greater than than what the event a certain Mm. event may mean to me like a family member might be sick somewhere or or a a close friend might be suffering somewhere and like you know it's it's you have to be like you you have to be selfish Mm. for sure to to win to win a world title to to win a championship to consistently show up at your best like it's it's a it's a commitment that a lot of you know not everyone is willing to to take and to sacrifice and some people like need to wait like some people need to wait to believe in themselves that like 
even if they sacrifice it, it's achievable. Yeah. Um, and then there's some people that like, I don't know, like that just have the will to make it happen no matter what anyone Regardless, says or, yeah. or what it looks like. Um, they're just going to keep, keep plugging away at it. Um, but yeah, I don't, I just, I don't know. There's, there's definitely a bit of luck that plays into it as well. Yeah, that's true. Um, but definitely the, how you handle your losses. And I think Kenny's probably handled his, his losses this year, the best I've ever seen him. Like, um, just having perspective of where he's at and, and like what he's put into it. And, um, you know, that's been, been amazing to watch and to watch him win multiple races. And like, you know, you could say that the luck wasn't on his side, especially like early on this, this season. Yeah. Um, there was some, there was some serious luck going Webb's way. I felt like, and, um, when Kenny was looking really, really fast. Um, but it's such a momentum thing with the, with yeah. the super cross, but I don't know, Kenny, Kenny has probably just let it kind of roll off his back better than he ever has before. I mean, mm. he's always been so good at letting the public in and like, he's got such a huge fan base because he's so open and he's yeah. so charismatic and f fun to just like, you want to get behind him and like, he he's just a he's a character yeah um and he and he has a lot of character on the bike and he i mean he's my he's the fa my favorite guy to watch ride a bike um and like you just want him to do it yeah. you know like he, he creates this aura that's like you know fuck and he needs to get it done this year like let's just you know when he's winning it's like it's it's um it's just rad like his baby's there and yeah. Courtney's there and Courtney and Griffin and hugs and kisses and like it's a family affair and like so many people out there resonate to that and yeah. just like you know the meaning of that like you know it's it's them before the trophy you know it's um it's it's pretty pretty damn rad I think Kenny's even grown this season. Like, I didn't enjoy the way that he handled the Dino stuff with the Lapper thing, but he was in the moment. Mm -hmm. So you can't be critical of dude in the moment. I think that you got to take the things that people say, like, on the podium. Or I'm actually kind of all for that shit because it creates more stuff to talk about mm -hmm. um, and it creates a better, I guess, media thing around it. But I feel like uh, he grew from that. Like, I, I really do think he grew from that experience with Dino. Um, and then he he did let it roll off his back. And, and I feel like in the moment he didn't. So mm. there's like, I think that's another thing with Kenny is that you visually see the changes in him as the season's happening. And mm. last year it was with him, like the way that he was dealing with not winning and Coop passing him on the last lap and all the history that those two boys have got like he really has just grown constantly and i think that that's probably another reason why people can get so behind him because with coop like you don't know mm. what he's going through you don't know any of the struggles like he keeps it as robocop as it gets mm. which is that's also cool you know what i mean because <laughs> that's an i guess another way of of doing it but kenny's just literally grown in front of our eyes just this season and then if you zoom out his, his whole career is going to be like that yeah definitely i think um yeah i think kenny was has obviously when he got caught up with with webb and and when he came back from his first injury and then compounded with that next one where he got caught in cooper's wheel um like he it just looked like he knew how fast he was mm. and he wasn't going to be patient like he wasn't going to wait for it he was going to make it happen and like and Webb saw an opportunity to really stuff it in there on him and like and you know knew that that Kenny was one of the guys and like Kenny didn't resonate with that very mm. well and like 
since then he's learnt to run his own race mm. and like that's the most powerful position that he can be racing from and it's providing like an incredible year that he's having right now and yeah he's he's grown so much um you know i mean he's come from europe and he's and he tried to find his way in in the big smoke in america and and like you know there's so much the land of opportunity and yeah. like with that much ability and potential and Pe- man, like and people grabbing at him left and right since yeah. he was a kid like i met him when he was 16 yeah. and like wild wild boy yeah very wild boy with yeah. a lot of people he had a lot of really great people in his corner and then basically everybody else was just like picking at you know like trying to get on board because of the potential that he had yeah but like yeah you if you think about the way that he's grown and matured like for a guy that was that much of a wild child Mm -hmm. to grow into the man that he is now with a kid with a beautiful wife that's like really he's in terms of athletes being role models he's set an amazing example this year of like you said how to deal with your losses and having that humility having that perspective um and it's crazy that like now he's kind of even getting criticized for that for not being hard enough and not being you know (laughs) yeah i i probably i'm i met him about five years ago four or five years ago um he was just coming I had just started with um RCH. K- Kerry Hartz yeah. yeah RCH yeah. on the Suzuki and then obviously went into like an incredible outdoor run on that yeah. bike and stuff and um like he yeah so much sort of charisma and so outgoing and like I was just if i'm just a fan of the sport and like it, it was it was really cool to meet him how'd, over, how'd that link up originally with you guys uh linked up originally he we were at ryan sheckler's golf um, oh, yeah, ryan yeah, sheckler yeah, foundation yeah. golf yeah. day um in st clemens in, in down in um encinitas yeah. down down that way and um yeah, that was when I first met him and we kind of hit it off right away is, you know, I'd spend a lot of time in America and obviously there's a lot of opportunity and and stuff that, that goes on and you're not sure who you trust and what way mm. to go. And he was sort of super open about that straight off the bat. He's like, you oh, know, really? I, you know, I, I coming here from Europe and like, you know, it's, it's just kind of hard to, to know exactly like who to trust, mm. um, like, um like on a friend you know you don't have your mates that you grew up with mm-hmm. and you know we kind of yeah we're able to to relate on those things and i think he sort of enjoyed like the the aussie humor and yeah. like not taking stuff too seriously and just sort of having a go and because he can talk shit don't worry about it yeah and like <laughs> around that time i was like from just the guy that i met and like um got to know briefly to the guy who you know was yeah like you know had a lot to say and like but obviously he could back it up and yeah it's just kind of like yeah it was it was it was fun to watch but it sort of didn't look super sustainable from Mm. the outside um but like i sort of got the vibe that he was a quality dude that had sacrificed a lot to get to the position where he was and he Mm. just was maybe you know in a position where it was like he missed home Mm. like he needed a bit of home and um but like yeah i don't know it's been it's been it's been great to watch his to watch his journey since meeting him um he's become a fan of surfing love surfing can surf um we have great mutual friend in frankie d'andrea um, oh yeah yeah who um was uh frankie was at fox yep. um but before fox he was at um at nike where i met frankie yeah right um and frankie's just one of those guys that 
the world needs more of. Um, and then, yeah, like Frankie went on to do the service, I'm pretty sure it, or wedded um, Kenny and Courtney at their wedding. Oh, and, really? Yeah. Um, and Frankie takes Kenny surfing anytime he wants to go surfing. And now he's based in San Clemente when he, well, he's got a, a home there and stuff. Yeah. And um, He's such a fucking talented athlete, Kenny, too. Yeah. Like, it is gnarly, man. He's so good on the mountain bike. He's obviously motocross. But, like, yeah, golf maybe not as much, but surfing, he surfs really well. Like, he's just such a freak talent, too. Yeah. I I mean, I don't know a lot about bike, motorbikes and, like, the technique and, and that sort of stuff. But, like, to watch Kenny ride, there's... I don't know if there's anything you, that you can critique. I don't know. I just, I, he just makes it look easy. And mm, like, I, especially when he's winning, eh? No one makes riding a bike look as easy as Ken Roxon when he's winning. Yeah. Like, even Atlanta this weekend, man, to have at 1.12 seconds and he was just like, bop, bop, bop. Yeah. Bop. I was just like, dude, yeah. what the fuck? fuck are you on right now because you are in a completely different place yeah for sure and and just yeah obviously yeah blitz and the whoops and that those sections look so brutal and obviously he ended up coming unstuck a little bit there and probably the best get off he probably could have hoped for that was an incredible could have have executed yeah that was insane not Um, honestly everybody else would have cartwheeled yeah. For the bike to step out the way that it did. Yeah. And like with that many whoops to go. Yeah. And to just like be able to step off, pick it up, not even have to restart the bike. Like, yeah. man, even if you want to talk about technique, like technically to do that is yeah. pretty mind blowing. Especially yeah. that was one of the longest whoop sections I've ever seen on a supercross track. Yeah. You could, you could say that him just finishing second after what could have went wrong right there yeah. was a huge achievement and the fact that he's still in this championship like i mean there's such a fine line at that at that speed and that level that like it can go seriously undone but um like you know he showed i, I was reading and heard that they made massive changes with that bike mm. out of sort of desperate times after such a poor event in um the second first atlanta race mm. and um you know he's going to show up and he's going to be he's going to bring that speed to the last two and it's going to be up to web to you know get a good start and and not be too grabby at trying to just like get this thing over the line and he showed if like you know he's capable of making some mistakes and like i don't know it was pretty rad to watch them kenny fought back at the very end there but like it's pretty cool just to see him ha- both hanging it out mm. there you know as, as dude much- coop was uncomfortable yeah Th- those last couple laps at atlanta <laughs> like he was uncomfortably going for it yeah and that i mean you know to to talk about kenny and the way that he's uh approaching the season and then you look at the way that coop's approaching it coop is just like win at all costs yeah fuck the bike setup yeah fuck anything that i'm going through win at all costs and there's two completely different approaches and those approaches are only a few points apart like you know yeah one of those approaches is not going to be good enough to win but after 15 races to still be this close with two completely different ways of getting it done yeah like it's pretty insane yeah they're chalk and cheese hey like so two different. completely different characters um two two su- you know two like such cool stories coming together um and they've already kind of been acknowledging that between them in some mm. of the stuff that i've seen and um but yeah when webb finished that last race it looked like instead of doing the burnout on the wall, he just wanted to lay down on the bitumen and just like go, oh, that's everything I have, yeah. you know, and like, it's what it takes. What do you think as a competitor yourself? So, I mean, honest, if I'm being honest, I want to see Ken fucking run it in. Did, at some point, make Coop think about it. Make Coop think about his front wheel and and that there might be something coming in hot <laughs> that, that's going to put him on the ground. But, you know, 
Kenny's pretty committed to this way of thinking and also kudos to staying committed and not abandoning ship Mm -hmm. midway through just because it's not working out yeah but like what do you think about that because in surfing i mean you can get pretty you can get pretty aggressive in surfing although it might not look like that to people from the outside but you can really surf heats aggressively yeah in surfing they've taken so much of that out of it and let Mm. it just come down to um like decision making and your ability and which is like the best way it could be surfing's in the best place it could be it's you know if you don't show up if you're not the best surfer if you're not on close to the best waves you got mm. you don't have a chance like yep. there's like there's an exchange at the start of a heat and sometimes that can take a while before someone gets a wave and things can get a little bit a bit a bit you know funky there but once the heat once someone stands up it's black and white someone's got priority someone doesn't and like if you got priority you're hoping someone sort of makes like, a mistake to give it up yeah or like if they want to even come close to you you know you have so much like leverage of which wave you want to catch mm. and your positioning you don't even have to worry about what the other person um you know if they're close to you where yeah the bikes it's not like that no. and like what do you think as a kenny fan you want kenny to win this championship should yeah. he be running it in and letting um, Coop know, or I think, I mean, the opportunities have been there, mm. um, and Webb has created them at times. And definitely, if there was one that came nat- came to him, he was taking it. And then I think he also looked for them at mm. times, especially like first corners and stuff. Yeah, um, where Kenny wants to do it Kenny's way yeah and I respect that like he wants to do it on his speed his talent like his I mean when I say talent his the amount of time and effort that he's put into it to get to be that good where he knows that he can win Mm. riding his own race that means from the outside it looks like that means everything to him Mm. he's not the kind of guy that's going to go and stuff it in and like back it up on Webb on the first corner and bury him back in the track and then like hope that he comes back out of the pack still up near the front to then like you know get back past a couple Mm. or like hold on to the front and like oh you know I've stuffed him back in the pack and like you know that was my tactic or that's you know like he's not looking at he's just looking he's not looking at that he's just going I'm like I'm a dad I'm out here i I'm fast enough to win it on my own. I'm going to do it on my own. And if it doesn't get it done, like it doesn't get it done. But Kenny's going to go, I mean, it was a bummer to see that what happened in the last race, but like he's, his speed is there. He's going to do it his own way. And he's already like proven he's going to do it his own way. He's, I I don't know as a fan and and following it closely this year I don't see Kenny changing his tact in any way Mm. and Webb is probably gonna try and play more games he's probably thinking about it as you know at the moment like he just wants it to to wrap up and he wants to make it happen and he's obviously probably pretty uncomfortable with how fast Kenny's going Mm. um, especially like what he showed the last two races um kenny brought the race back to him which was like kudos to to cooper for having the persistence and like fighting off the boys at barsha and um tomac didn't even really get close to him Mm. um on a track where you'd think tomac would just be blitzing it and tomac even struggled in the whoop so he didn't catch that ground up that you would have expected to see like Mm. at that level that kenny was riding um but yeah Kenny brought it back for him and, and opened up the door and that was hard to watch that was but you know Kenny fought back and it ended up like we <laughs> Webb close. almost went over the hangers on yeah. the like second last corner and it still could have been Kenny's but I think Kenny will go out there and ride his own race and he's like the amount of time that he probably spent like on the couch thinking about trying and and wishing to be back at the level that he needed to be at for a championship 
while nursing the injury that the second injury that he got yeah. from from just like getting caught up in the in the web of web yeah um he doesn't want anything to do with that and he's shown that he doesn't want anything to do with that and like i think kenny got super frustrated and was like you know you want to play those games i'm going to play those games but clearly someone or like his plan is not to play that game and Mm. shortly after he stated that he's continued to do the kenny program and it's paying off for him like he didn't go the next race and just like yeah you know target web like web likes to target him like he's just running his own race and he's not going to change that and if he ends up second in the championship he's going to be super proud of himself and he's going to come back next he's going to go to who knows he might take i don't know if he's committed to doing outdoors or or what his plan is but um he'll show up next year and and have learned like if he's at this level Mm. after his injuries after the year that he had last year like he proved to himself last year that he could win and then he didn't have the stamina to like Mm. be there at the very end and then this year he's like two races to go and his speed is out of this world like he's untouchable unless he made his own mistake Mm. like he's probably now proven to himself again like I'm there like Mm. I can do it like I'm gonna do it he's gonna make it happen he's too damn good not to and as long as he sticks to his own his own guns and I think he's he's learnt those lessons and like that story is being being written out like in his own way Mm. and especially now becoming a father and like yeah he's he's married a beautiful girl in Courtney she's the most love she's super super lovely girl yeah and um he like yeah he's 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 in, he's inspiring he's a, he's an ultimate he's the ultimate role model um yeah. for for someone coming up like you know it's crazy what you, you were saying before you were talking about like oh last year he was getting his first win again from the, those injuries dude we just we were cheering for kenny to get his first win just last year you yeah. know and then now he gets a win and then all of us are like come on dude win a championship yeah so we went from this jump of yeah. expecting him to or like wanting him to win and like cheering on this win and then instantly you're like oh so you can still win okay cool now go win that championship please dude exactly. it's like that's a huge jump that we're all just making and i think a it shows you um how good he is that everyone just like knows that that's possible and i guess it it also just shows like this uh this want that we have to see the like the best dudes get it done you know it's like it's not enough for us as like hardcore fans yeah to just be like damn dude you gotta win after that we're like okay get, get the championship yeah exactly it's, it's hectic it's so gnarly and and we feel like oh dude just stuff it in there just yeah. like make it happen like put yourself on the line he's too fast he's too good he, i think he knows he doesn't need to do it that way and mm. if it takes if it doesn't happen this year he's gonna make it happen like i think he just knows and he's proving to himself and like building that house back up from mm. like absolutely knocking it down um and he's like yeah it's it's you just yeah as a fan of his you want to you want him to make it happen and you think oh if he just you know yeah a bit more mongrel a bit yeah yeah, yeah. like think a bit more tactically or like but i don't know just the fact that we're riding on his wins and like wishing for the championship and stuff like he appreciates that Mm. he he's like yeah i'm i'm doing it i'm doing it for myself and i'm i'm doing it like my way and i think that's super admirable how much does being a dad change the change the landscape obviously well like you said you had your best season in in 18 when you had your first child but is there is it like the extra accountability is it extra motivation or does it or is there a part of you that shies away from risk a little bit more than you kind of ever have or how did it kind of affect you uh i think it just gives you a purpose to like not give a shit 
you know yeah, like really? you don't have the time to you don't have the time to like mm. overthink anything you don't have the time to go and like feel like you got to throw all the toys out of the cot and reset things when things aren't going well or like you're not you're not you know the you don't have time for it mm. all you have time for is like <laughs> like you have the responsibility of being a parent and the time and energy that that takes and then the other time that you have which is bugger all is a hundred percent focused on mm. like what your career and passion and focus and drive is aside from being a father mm. and it's almost like when you when you rob all that time that you normally had where you're like oh i could do a bit more of this training and I could change this a little bit and it'll create like a stronger like athlete and yeah. like you know more resilient and like can do bigger airs do rah, rah, rah. like you just fester things in your head yeah. because you're obsessed and you're at the peak at the top of your level and like that's how you got there and how you're gonna keep getting better yeah but when you become a father and like all that time is just like so it becomes like super concentrated like the effort that you do have to put into surfing or motocross it just becomes like okay we're going all in for this time because yep. it is limited but you end up getting maybe more out of that time yeah your your child asks for a hundred percent of your attention from the start if you're not there like you're hopeless like you're not being a good parent yeah and like you learn that that is essential and like that's number one priority so then it's like okay you can focus on your child and you can care for them and tend to them how they need you to be there for them okay how does that feel towards like my career like what mm. i'm passionate about like i've got an hour now to go surf and like put that like hunt like i've done what all i can do here as a father like now I'm going to go and like apply that energy and focus and mm. like purpose to the other thing that I'm super passionate about and love doing. And like, it's, it's like a, an, a release, like yeah. an escape. Yeah. Um, all of a sudden, like you're not looking for much to be satisfied. Like yeah. you're looking at the, at it like, man, like I got, I got a pair of boardies on, I'm going for a surf, like this is my career, like, you know, like I, the whole sensation of just getting to do that and like the appreciation like is, is on a different level yeah. and like you don't then like leave the beach and then go home and like complicate things by yeah. like looking for little tweaks and whatever and um it's just like okay like that was that like then it's back to being a dad and then it's like you know it's really like black and white yeah um and like that's just me speaking personally um and that was the only way like i was in survival mode i was trying to be a parent for the first time but i was chasing a dream of being a world champion and like i got so much like um like sort of motivation to do it to yeah. like support my family and yeah. like um and make my family proud um that like i was just kind of showing up like and just going this is like my time to sort of play and mm. enjoy and do what i love and like um what's the worst that can happen you know i'm gonna go home to my family yeah and um yeah that you, you do get a big perspective shift and like it's something that you could never like prepare someone for and like explain to them oh yeah like this is being a parent like. is really cool and it feels like this and it's going to look like this and be ready for this like i don't even i wouldn't even attempt to try and tell someone that or like walk them through that that's so fucking scary dude that it, like that sounds like you're explaining dmt or something <laughs> <laughs> it's like this will fuck with your world so much yeah you just won't know anything the way that it was before it's basically like what your you thought your purpose was like for mm. being all of a sudden is like holy shit 
this is really my purpose of being to mm. be responsible for like a little human with like the partner that you love and like you know 50 50 of what makes you guys makes this mm. you know little human that you're completely 100 percent responsible for and they love you unconditionally which is a love that you'll never experience before in your life mm. you know there's no other connections to it except for you and your partner like i don't know it's, i guess it would even um strengthen the bond that you got bet- with your partner as well because you've created something together that you obviously didn't have before too yeah definitely and i i up until olivia was born my daughter i always felt like i had to like fly the flag for like you know my 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 our relationship and like you know i wanted to be like the man and like it's just you know it's just being a man like you want to like carry it all and you want to like support your partner and support my wife and like um you you had like an idea of the role that you were going to play oh no like before that like i just felt like i wanted to like support her and like i'm was like asked for her commitment to me and like this crazy Mm. world that i've asked her to come into and like you know everything that goes with it and like i was like felt like i had to be like the strong one sort Mm. of thing to like to 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 um like get us around and like and make it all work and train on the track yeah and 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 that is definitely you know like it was it worked and but when you watch your partner like when when they have to to have birth and and to a little human like the strength that a woman has like we wouldn't exist without that Mm -hmm. like they're way more badass than we are like they are just you know there's like we're we're soft compared (laughs) to that like we, we don't experience anything like that in our lives like so I found like I had like it it taught me so much respect around like mm. her resilience and her strength and what she was capable of and like it also gave her so much too to just like you know what what's gnarlier than having birth like mm. nothing like she's prepared like it's just a, a crazy experience and um kind of makes things a lot more 50 50 now like she's yeah. she's a mum. like yeah. she's she can she can handle the kids like when i can't handle the kids and she can like just get stuff done and like doesn't need me to like feel yeah. like i'm like have to you know like play the like male role like i'm super confident in her like running the ship and yeah. like you don't you don't really know how that's all going to go before yeah. you know having kids so yeah um yeah it definitely strengths strengthens that 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 relationship that you have and that that like commitment that you've made to each other just sort of goes to a different place as well yeah obviously that it was funny um it's just uh, it's funny thinking about kids so much because i was at the contest and that's a fucking nursery like the v the not the vip the athlete section of the wsl is a nursery at this point like yeah. there was so many kids running around yeah. and then like staying with jack and then he's like facetiming banks constantly and uh and i was speaking to friends this morning they're sort of married and they're just about to start thinking about having kids and um patty said that she's just scared of the process and i just never even factored in the fear that a woman would have the first time before getting pregnant like Mm -hmm. am i going to be able to have a kid am i going to be able to handle carrying the kid is it like am i going to be able to handle giving birth all these crazy fears that i'd never even factored in i mean the biggest fear i have to go through is like getting ready for a fucking jiu-jitsu tournament you know it's just like that's my idea of fear in my life and just even from that one conversation with patty today and then spending this week um with like jack and then around that wsl event i'm just like dude it's so gnarly for a chick to even like commit to having a kid yeah absolutely um it's like 
you know what it's funny that you say that like we like the tour like is so set up um yeah like the tour is very much set up for families um and like oh i don't know where i'm going just with start like, again with, with no 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 it's all good so um, fucked you up by moving that mic that's no, right um yeah the responsibility for a woman to like carry a child and like go through all the body changes and like yeah. deal with all the emotions and hormones and endorphins and like just everything that goes with it like is an absolute roller coaster and then like postnatal depression which is super real and um they're absolute warriors mm. like they're actually warriors like what they go through and what they sign up for and like yeah until the one that you your significant other like goes through that and you're there with them and experience that like you're not gonna try and explain that to someone mm. like and then every birth is completely different there's no two births the same yeah. like there's just so much that can happen and then you just like hold on to like obviously there's a lot of like check checkups and stuff that happen coming into like the final stages but still it's like you just want a healthy baby like mm. you know with limbs and fingers and just you know able to like have the opportunity you know that you're responsible for mm. it's like it puts a lot of things in perspective for sure yeah. but like it's funny you say that about the event being a nursery for like families and the kids and like the tour is was set up so well for families for before like, covid before yeah. covid was set up so well um to have kids and and travel as a family and and do 80 percent of the tour safely and uh, experience the world as a family it's like one of the most coolest like yeah. badass experiences you can you can have and i got to do that two years in a row with olivia she'd been around went around the world twice before she was two and like we just made it happen and some of the best memories that we could have could have had and now it's like with covid and um the complications of the world and how unstable it is and how unsafe it is to travel with the family and it's impossible and like we just got announced the schedule last saturday for the rest of the tour season um and then like including like myself being australian being a part of the olympic team mm. the schedule actually looked like presented as i had three days to pack for six and a half months on the road really and like is that from west Oz? that was that was from newcastle okay to come to narrabeen to then go on to western australia yeah yeah to then go from western australia leave the family at home and be on the road overseas for mm. five months straight that that um you know includes like it worked out to be like eight different countries um and like yeah i mean it's super overwhelming like mm. and it was just like do you get much indication of that that's on the cards before it gets released uh no no so you just sit there so we wait. were waiting yeah we were waiting to to see where everything would fall mm. um and we kind of were of the um intention like we we had heard that it would be another sort of group of events and one more you know trip out of australia but the way that it's planned to have events before and after the olympics it just equals like a huge amount of time but is is the olympics a different commission or something and that's where some of it comes from is that like the olympics falls under a different federation for surfing or something yeah well the olympics is 
connected to the, the ISAs, which is the International Surfing Association, which is actually the Amateur Surfing Association. Oh, because the, <coughs> the Olympics is all amateur. Yeah, exactly. Oh. So, yeah, it's going to be a different style of like competitive format and also different requirements to like to get to the Olympics. Yeah. So like from WA, I'm required to go straight to El Salvador yeah. just to like put a rashi on and paddle out and say that I competed in that event, even if I lost in the first round. Really? That until I do that, I'm not 100% eligible, eligible for the Olympics. So yeah, um, it's just a, it's a different set of requirements to get to the olympics yeah. um and at the moment obviously that comes with its own risk and like um sacrifice and yeah. so yeah the wsl then sort of announced that there would be other events um in north america around yeah. um that event which then would lead straight into the olympics which would then lead into like south america and tahiti and Fuck. back to north america um you know like looking at it it's like well i got to fly through like eight different countries self on my own um probably have a 99 percent chance of getting covid somewhere <laughs> at some time yeah. which event is it going to affect you know oh. like when am i going to get it um like i'm going to be away from the family i could be stuck in a hotel in a third world country for two weeks by yourself like yeah like by myself wow. like you know two weeks in a hotel and then two weeks quarantine in australia so a month away from even coming home like it would be a month away from seeing my family if i wasn't able to compete mm. and needed to come home i couldn't um so that's all been really like radical and being a father with a young family and um that's been that's been challenging for it's a sure huge ask it's a huge ask and like it's just um to to like put it in perspective of like you know you you make the commitment to to go and know what you're signing up for but then like you're in fear the whole time because yeah. like you're there because you want to compete and that's all you want to focus on but like the whole time there's so much other shit going COVID's on covid's around the corner um it's it's a it's yeah it's just like this um like desperation to like have a world tour but then like you know the fear of everyone that has to make the sacrifice and leave their yeah. leave their countries and um it is it's desperate times though right because like the wsl i mean just from me as a fan i literally have nothing to do with the surfing industry in any way at all so just purely as a fan of like you and jack and a couple of the guys that i know the wsl seems like it's really improved surfing like it's been a pretty epic um I guess like a like a yeah a league format for that the production's been insane the social media has been insane like the product that they're producing and that costs a lot of money so it's mm -hmm. like to see both sides of the argument it's like well if WSL doesn't pull the trigger then it's like it just goes away because yeah. it needs cash to keep running but then yeah. on the other side it's like fuck how important is it to keep or like what what's the cost yeah to everybody to keep it running you know yeah for and sure. obviously be hard for you to talk about it you know that's fine yeah. but but yeah it's it's gnarly yeah it, it it definitely is and like yeah for um i i do think that the wsl is in the best position it ever has been package wise and production wise and the, mm. the level of surfing and obviously the locations are changing at the moment just to adapt to the times and yeah but it is survival and yeah. like and everyone is willing um and it is it is happening at the moment and like it's awesome that it's in australia and guaranteed for events and um yeah it's it's awesome it's just going to be a, another 
who who knows like it could be another two super challenging years ahead mm. like it's it's not like there's any su- great light at the end of the tunnel especially being a professional surfer on the WSL from Australia mm. like there's no talks of quarantine changing and um with yeah minimal time in between events it just means like big stints overseas um mm. but you know who knows hopefully everyone's get starting to get vaccinated and yeah. like there's options starting to pop up and countries are becoming safer and yeah i don't know traveling at the moment internationally is like this hectic strangest thing you can experience really oh going to hawaii this year end of last year was yeah like there's like 20 people on like the flight from sydney to la wow and then oh, so you flew to LA you didn't fly to Honolulu no you got to fly to mainland America to then get really COVID tested yeah to to get a negative so you can then fly on to Hawaii which was great because Hawaii had a pretty good handle on COVID yeah okay but then it still wasn't good enough like the events came undone and we, oh, really? we came home early yeah we were there for, we meant to be in Hawaii for two events and then on to um North America to um, Northern California for the third event, but we only just got through the first event. It went on hold for five days. Ten people in the staff got COVID, oh. and then yeah, they the the second event in Hawaii got cancelled, and then there was like it was too big an ask of an ask to to get everyone to stay and then go to Northern California where the numbers were way higher than Hawaii, so everyone just sort of returned to their countries and then they set up this australia leg which has been super hats off to them like yeah. to pull this off this is big crowds too big crowds and super welcomed and like i think starting off in newcastle where it's such a passionate town like so welcoming of like an event yeah, that's like a that surf town. i think it's like yeah they've done it done it right um you know we had some like we haven't scored with waves but like now we're going to go to wa and like it'll pump. it's a great time of year the yeah. setups are a lot different and the wave quality is going to be there for sure um but we're going to get four events done and um what happens after that is what happens after that <laughs> <laughs> just yeah. get through it yeah dude it's crazy that the olympics are going to happen yeah at the moment the olympics is happening so it's um you know i think japan like they're such lovely respectful people have you been to japan much i've been there about five times yeah sick. and um loved it every time it's a sick country eh? yeah it's yeah most beautiful people oh, so polite food, so kind people. yeah food love the food the country um, itself like visibly is amazing yeah it's like it's yeah yeah it's like um yeah just the cleanliness of it but then like the chaos and but then somewhat organized and like dude when i went to japan like one of the first times i remember in tokyo in international airport in uh narita and was walking with my coffin board bag and there was like they don't look up they just all like walk in formation in like yeah. the direction of the flow and like yeah. all of a sudden they're all just like dominoes not falling over my <laughs> surfboard because i got this thing behind me that is like they're not used to so they're all just falling over my surfboard in the airport and i was like oh well welcome to like you know such an overpopulated like yeah place like that compared to australia it was pretty eye-opening i love the um i love like the just the culture the just that samurai mindset and obviously like the samurai mindset doesn't exist now in the form of samurais but you look at dudes like uh did you ever watch that netflix doco like euro dreams of sushi no. and oh man you gotta watch it this one dude's like 85 years old and to work in his uh he's got like this tiny tiny sushi bar that's like literally the width of what pretty much what we're in now it's like a bar like fridges underneath and he just is in this tiny little zone and if you want to work with him i think his son is like not even allowed to make sushi rolls or like when they were doing the doco his son was only allowed to do the rice and it's like 15 years of working for his dad and like and then his dad is just has literally made the exact same shit 
for like <laughs> 60 years and is still just trying to improve at wow. making sushi. But that's just Japan yeah, right there. And yeah. that's like Japanese motorcycles, Japanese sushi, like everything, Japanese transport, way of, way of life. Like they're just so uh, like that samurai mindset is like so ingrained in that culture. And it's yeah. pretty, that's pretty lost in like a lot of other places. You know, a lot of times it's about, you know, disposable everything and quick and fast and yeah. that culture has just never let go of that samurai mindset and it makes a super unique and beautiful country absolutely yeah and like um like just even the like the nature that surrounds like such an overpopulated mm. place is so special like the like it's just ages really well i don't know they preserve it what they can in like such a unique special way and it's just like enchanted like mm. you know like there's something really special like the temples and some of the islands that i've been to um over there like chasing waves and like just yeah, i don't know like there's just these random temples that mm. they they've they've just they use really like every day still and yeah. like they're just in the middle of nowhere and you come across them when you go and searching for a wave and it's just like this immaculate like little zone that's just like you just know you're stepping into like an area of like you know complete like commitment to you know yeah to like themselves and like yeah. their history and um yeah they're so detail orientated and like so like precise and specific like they just i think as humans you you always will appreciate like yeah. detail and precision yeah. and like commitment to like making the most of something like and like the hard way yeah even though like it's better but harder yeah it's less but yeah more. more yeah yeah that's so true yeah have you ever scored with uh, like a typhoon swell or something there yeah i have because dude there are some ridiculous waves that yeah. happen in japan yeah oh I, I went when i was like 16 to an island called miyazaki and we just went there for a magazine surf magazine trip to surf in this uh wave pool and um <coughs> we planned to go there for five days and base the trip around the wave pool and if we got any little waves it was a bonus and we, <laughs> and we that like was the mindset. Uh, yeah like it was like this wave pool was going to be closing down and it was like this humongous investment and it just didn't work out but like the wave was sick yeah. and like it was like oh it's closing down and we could get in there for super cheap and like be one of the last surfers to use it so we went and did it um and it like we got so much swell and surfed so many good waves around there that like we were almost like oh like forgot what we were there for like, yeah. we didn't want to go to the wave pool we were just scoring like this two like insane typhoon swells with like really good wind and like proper six foot waves and like surfing in these harbors and like man-made um like break walls yeah, with these yeah, like yeah. Cr crazy yeah. like cross rocks everywhere but then like somehow the way they had them set up there was like a legitimate wave that would happen when a typhoon would come and we were surfing in the most random places yeah I've, see. I've seen those um actually footage from that that place with like those big cross cement deals yeah it's like they're all crosses and they all just like get th thrown in together to make like and and they're not trying to make waves object. yeah yeah it's <laughs> like just create like tsunami protectors but like yeah creating create like man-made waves pretty much what so what is the it's it's always uh, like a little bit weird when a new sport comes into the olympics because like there's not necessarily a culture around it and then uh, around obviously there's culture around the olympics but not in the specific sport like skateboarding's kind of going through it and there's like a little bit of an argument of like does our sport even need the olympics kind of deal golf was the same mm -hmm. you know dude how crazy is it that the last two olympics have been there's been like a full health outbreak that's like kind of caused 
shit because what was it in Brazil? Zika. Zika virus. Dude, that's insane that there's been two things for the mm. last Olympics. Mm. But that created a lot of discussion because there was like a legitimate downside to going to the Olympics. Yeah. So then it created a discussion around like, well, what do the Olympics even mean? Yeah. So for you, what does it mean to, to go and try and win an Olympic gold medal? Yeah. Well, like, I mean, to just... It's worth it. You know, like I never dreamt of it um mm. and it's a it's a new like opportunity that popped up um and like as a dad like i think it really resonated with me to like want to be there mm. um and be a part of that story and like i've never like looked at surfing as a like you know you prepare for a pinnacle moment like once every four years Mm. and like you just shape your life around like that moment and that day and as it is like surfing's never been like that it's Mm -hmm. like you got to be peaking for nine months of the year you got to be showing up you got to like it's so different um but like when I first found out about it, I was like, "Oh, like I just want to win a world title." Like I don't know if I've got room to like, yeah, to have this 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 um like distraction come in sort of thing. And but then like once I sort of sat sat with it, I was like, "Dude, I want to be a part of the Olympics." Like how incredible to be, you know, one of only two one of only four total but two australian males to be going Mm. to the olympics for surfing for the very first time like to to have that um forever is just like i'll make the sacrifice to go to el salvador after rottenness and 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 do it like i'm i'm doing it like i'm not missing the opportunity like i've qualified for the olympics i've got an opportunity to go and win a gold medal like for surfing that like just to be an Olympian, mm. um, I think it's super. Like su- I get goosebumps even you say like to be an Olympian. It's like geez, yeah, it's got some weight, man. Yeah, it's and to go at the same time as skateboarding is super cool. Um, so many similarities across skating and surfing, and I've <coughs> always pulled so much inspiration from skateboarding, and mm. it's the only other sport where you're like not connected to your board and like there's a lot of similarities and especially with airs and stuff and I've just, yeah true eh? i've always loved skating and um it's going to be like pretty amazing to to be going to the olympics for the first time as well as skateboarding like this sort of fresh like new um like introduction to the olympics of yeah like a little bit different to the mold that's always been there and like even with the snow like snow side of things and um like even skateboarding is going to have like skateboard park um which is like such a you know there's a real freedom of expression in doing that as well just like surfing Mm. like it's not just one moment it's like connecting all the dots and yeah and making it all happen and like dealing with like the 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 unpredictability um and like yeah i think that's 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 pretty cool that's yeah it's really special it's interesting too when you said about um your kids because let's say your kids don't want to surf like you've got you 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 got two girls right i've got a girl and a boy girl and a boy yeah but let's say they don't they're not interested in surfing at all and that's not a route that they want to take and let's say your daughter does gymnastics and your son does wrestling and it's like they might have no connection to the surfing side of things, but to be an Olympian for your kids and, you know, there's a, a host of, like, even if you're that, like triathlon and there's so much stuff that your kids could do uh, as, you know, sporting um, sporting kids that they could look up to their dad as an Olympian and, and resonate with uh, that sport because there's such a, like a large umbrella absolutely yeah it's it's a like you you're an olympian like that's doesn't matter what sport really um 
it's just to be a part of like the pinnacle of athletics mm. um and the 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 world stops and watches and the world knows um surfing is just you know at the end of the day it's it's surfing and it has its its following and like unless you live near the beach mm. you don't follow it um where the olympics is the olympics it's like the pinnacle of sport it's like the moment it's gonna be broadcast to tvs around the world that yeah, are going to be seeing surfing for the people. very first time and if i can be one of those guys um to for like kids to see like from who knows where um and like for them to like smile and go oh you know like i want to go to the beach like how do i get to the beach like they that's might, so true eh? yeah that's like an opportunity that would that didn't exist three four years ago are you gonna get the tattoos no way not getting the ring tattoo there's no chance break dance <laughs> <laughs> i feel like that's just like a prerequisite you nah. go to the olympics get the rings no nah. i'll get a medal yeah yeah true eh? <laughs> <laughs> that's probably the move i'm after a medal um you've been in an interesting position in your career because you've been like a child prodigy of surfing and you got like would you, is that fair to say do you think like coming from what like i definitely look at you as a prodigy child from australia and you're in that that era where you got picked up by red bull real early and then you were nike real early so you you went into like the top of the sport um in terms of like the commercial side and then the opportunities that brung was it a trip at your age at that time to get aligned with those brands and then the opportunities that that then bought because man you've done some incredible things through surfing and and those different kind of partnerships that you've, you've gotten um yeah it i mean growing up from on the sunshine coast and having two older two older brothers and they were professional longboarders my mum and dad rode longboards we grew up like i grew up a part of the the malibu club at noosa mm. and like weekends were spent riding longboards um like a saturday would just be all day at the beach with at the mal club um and like i got sponsored first sponsor when i was nine by oakley um and o'neill and i was a token like my brothers were sponsored by o'neill and oakley and professional longboarders and i was like the token third brother that like could surf and um i was just sort of like in it like along yeah. for the ride sort yeah. of thing and and to be honest until i was like 16 when i was about 14 my brothers like there's five years between me and my middle brother seven between me and my eldest brother oh, so right. i was a little bit there's a bit of a gap there so by the time i was like 14 my middle brother was like australian longboard champion he was like 19 20 and and seb was a bit older and they were doing the international like world longboarding tour at the time and yeah, i'm like right. and i'm like 14 at home getting a few opportunities like um through sponsorship to do some shortboard stuff like bits and pieces and doing some junior events but not like just also riding motorbikes i i bought my first dirt bike when i was 13 i didn't get to that before but once i could afford it that was the only that was when really? i got my first bike so well, let's get we'll fully re, we'll fully explain that whole situation yeah i, I want to yeah. get into that yeah um yeah i think i spent my first sponsorship like actual do no way. endorsement dollars like one of the first things i did was buy a dirt bike what bike did you get an rm80 no shit and what I, what year was that um it was like a 80 or 90 model had like the purple and yellow cow print seat yeah right it had like the one side radiator yeah, yeah and like yeah, yeah. thing like leaked oil everywhere and it was the sickest thing in the world that's like, so rad and it had like this tiny sprocket on the back so it was like high end uh yeah like big top it? speed big top yeah, speed yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> So it was pretty That's safe. My technical it was pretty. It was pretty safe. Like taking yeah, okay. off, it was like a bigger, 
it felt like a bigger bike for me at the time i hadn't really yeah. ridden many i'd ridden like 65s and stuff but yeah then, did you have like an attachment to suzuki no nah, oh it was just the bike that yeah you my dad went and found it yeah like yeah i've i had i think it was like 1400 bucks that's g shit spending your first pon- sponsor check as a 14 year old on an rm80 <laughs> yeah 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 that was like and then i was a part of the boys like i wasn't borrowing any bikes anymore i get on the bike at my house at my parents house which is like across the road from the beach yeah hop on it fire it up in the shed like down the street like maybe about five minute ride on the roads like just like zooming past each street waiting for the cops like, so checking like for the cops yeah. every time it was like almost more fun than the ride itself and just yeah, yeah riding out to my mate's place that he actually was had a lot of his dad had a lot of property um just right at the big roundabout at Coolum and oh yeah turned one of the lots into a motocross track so yeah. his his son was like one of my good mates that he um he was winning like the club days and state like level and yeah. he was 65 85 battling with Ford Dale um like he was on the Cowie while Ford was on the Yamaha yeah and um yeah he's he was he he was um he was pretty talented on a bike but then yeah how how were you at riding um back then oh don't know i was at the like when i first bought my bike like i got photos of um like meeting ford for the first time when i'd first bought my bike and I'd, how much is ford older than you i think we're like the same age yeah because how old are you now 32 yeah oh so we're the same age yeah yeah i think or maybe ford's a little bit younger I think he's I think 32. we're the same age yeah I think we're all pretty yeah and um yeah I went out to the Coolum track and like did a club day and like my son oh I, um a screw in like the throttle um body thing yeah um somehow a screw got in there so the throttle just stayed open oh. when i was switching it off yeah and i launched my bike off a berm like real like you know i was a absolute liability and like <laughs> my fork the fork seals on my bike were just squirting out oil everywhere and like i didn't give a shit. i didn't care one bit though like i was just loving it like um i didn't go straight back out there by no means i kind of stuck to my mate's track after that but yeah um yeah i i i was like just a grommet like you know at the same time like i was i was spending so much time like building bmx jumps and like digging holes and making like rhythms of bmx jumps like eight packs and yeah 10 packs and like thought it was the funnest thing ever and like doing x ups and no footers and like tail whips and like you know i was just smashing my shins up and like i had the something skins like yeah. shin guards literally they were just called skins right skins yeah and you velcro, did you, wait, velcro did you the back. like velcro them to the top tube of your, your bike yeah yeah, yeah i had a <laughs> that was the sickest shit i had the red red line no yeah red line but it had the green one but Oh, I can't remember. I had this like new fancy frame on it. It was like one of the first BMXs I had, this green one with like a fatter bit in the front. Yeah, right. Um, but yeah, just riding bikes and skating and like surfing was just a, it was like, I was mostly riding like, the only time that I was really committed to surfing growing up was like going to Mel Club days with the family and like just riding standing up on a boogie board short board whatever then you surf a heat on a mail and then you're like it's just like yeah going back to what we were talking about before like when i first got like like these incredible opportunities and endorsement deals and like money i could have never like dreamed of like um growing up like i i didn't like value like my surfing in any way regard higher than anyone else i was just like when i was like 14 and my brothers were 19 and 22 the longboarding tour was actually dying Mm. and like there was no money like they were over in like beer it's in france like competing for like 
not enough money to pay for their travels and then they're not getting like funded like in any endorsement deals to like ride mm. the long boards they get free mails and gear but like you know it's they didn't it's not like sustainable so that, then it was like was that weird when you started getting like huge checks from these big companies well it wasn't until i was like 18 mm. like actually like some some like some money that I was like couldn't believe was like gonna happen and stuff like my first real contract mm. but like when I was 14 and and the boys my brothers were like oh we've got to start looking for like jobs and like what are we gonna do like mm. my middle brother was Queensland emerging players as an opening batsman like a really top level batsman and we've got an incredible family friendship relationship with the Haydens because Bart was oh, yeah. at such a high level of cricket and met Matt at the Gabba because Bart would um, go to Brisbane twice a week because he was in the Queensland Emerging Players and um, ended up being the page boy at Matt and Kelly's wedding and like that's where it all sort of started but Bart was an incredible cricketer. I didn't know that either. Yeah, and he gave that up to do the world longboarding tour and then that like didn't work out because the tour actually died it was like the oxbow world longboarding tour at the time mm. and then um there was no money there to be made at all but went on to like drive around california in this dodge van thing with no windows selling these um um pacific oh Something Pacific, a guy from the Gold Coast that sponsored Bart and Seb, all three of us for Mal's. And Bart was driving up and down the coast of California selling these things out the back of the van. Like, no way. Yeah, that was when he was like 21 or something. Like, just, yeah, he's a cool cat, Bart. Just, just hitting the road over in California. But so, yeah, when I was 14, I mean, I was pretty young, but I saw like, you know, I didn't grow up, we didn't grow up with any like, freedom of like money and opportunity yeah. it was like dad worked um as a tiler from when he was 16 till he was 60 um mm. to like like that was just how dad was and mum was a stay at home and mum and she'd drive us to events and get us around and but like we we would we never had money um but like had incredible opportunity through like the sacrifice of mm. my dad working um as a tiler and then mum being a stay-at-home mum and looking after us um <coughs> so yeah i was pretty young but like went through a lot at a young age just like mum going through breast cancer when i was really young and having how a big, old were you when that was all going down i was five. Oh, really so i didn't really like i didn't get it but like my brothers definitely got it yeah and then as i was probably getting like to that 14 15 age at like really started to understand like what yeah. what it was like how long did she battle with it for um the first time like i'm not sh i'm not sure exactly how long to be honest she was like getting on the train on her own like a couple of bucks to go down to brisbane to get her like radium and stuff and um she didn't like want any didn't want us to like see a lot no and stuff yeah. so she was trying to be super secretive but obviously like going through that stuff is gnarly and like take a huge toll on like your energy and like your looks and mm. everything so um but yeah when i was 14 something just like shifted in my mind like i love doing all this shit and there's a lot of stuff that i'm pretty good at mm. and makes me really happy but longboarding like I was Australian longboarding champion when I was 15, um, in like the under 18s, um, or I was 14 in the under 18s. And, um, it was like, but like, there's no money there, but like riding the short board, like that's sort of like the golden nugget to like fly the flag for the family and like give back, like to the upbringing that I have and mm. like, you know, like create, like I didn't know where it was going to go but I just knew that like money came with shortboarding mm. like there was opportunity like there was a career there there was like there was these guys like on the Gold Coast like there was just you know Mick and Joel and um 
Oki, Luke, like these guys are making proper money and like having a career and like obviously Slater and <coughs> but I but like I didn't have a focus on on that or anything I just saw the opportunity yeah and like I love to do it I love to ride any sort of board I love to ride any sort of bike whatever skate like there was a lot and I never had any pressure to go any one way so everything stayed super like available in my life like it was like go and take whatever risk in any direction and you're not going to be judged from anyone in the family like just live your life like and i'm so thankful for that i still like take that those morals today and live by them and i'll carry that on to my kids no doubt and yeah um and yeah it was just like okay when i was 14 I had some sponsorship and then I got my first contract with a little bit of money. Um, and then it was like, well, we can't, I kind of had decided like, I'm going to have a go. I, shortboarding actually made me super uncomfortable. Like, really? Because the shortboarding scene was not a family scene. The mm. shortboarding scene was like a cutthroat, like soccer dad, like, yeah. or mom. And it was like, what happened in that heat? Like, why didn't you beat that kid? Like, you know, what went wrong? Like, what do we need to do? Like, yeah. um, don't hang out with that kid. Like that, like, I didn't know that world. Yeah. I wasn't comfortable in that world. But what I had at that time was two older brothers that I like, from before I could even remember, I was trying to catch up to. Yeah. So I was always like naturally competitive with yeah. trying to be at their level to fit in, to hang out with their mates, to like yeah. be a part of the cool kids and like go to these cool places that they go to and surf these these waves and like just keep up. Yeah. So I think that's where the where the competitiveness came, from. came yeah. from. It wasn't um, being brought up like talking about any sort of competition or like mm. idolizing any sort of athletes or anything like that it was just like it was just uh, um do as you wish and we'll support you and like you just kind of got to go to school sort of thing um so i sort of dabbled like i met like geordie smith and jeremy flores and those guys were like coming from South Africa and France to Australia at like 14 to do surf contests. And I was just like this snowy head kid from Noosa that like hadn't really competed on a short board and didn't really care too much. But like, was like, I'm like gonna dabble in this because it's the only way to like, you know, give yeah. back to the family. Um, so I started to like get a bit involved in that. And like Geordie was like so arrogant and like, they're just so sure of themselves and like so sure yeah. that like they were going to be like the next Slater and whoever or they're going to be better and they've like, been like bred to do that yeah almost. and they had these perfect techniques and these amazing little boards like i mean every grommet has one now but like back then only like seeing like what geordie and jeremy were riding it was really? like they had these like refined like special little mini toothpicks that were like you know and they were ripping no way and like i just yeah i guess i just found a way to like go like yeah this is un this is like feel super uncomfortable but like maybe like that's just what i'm gonna do like i'm gonna be in this uncomfortable space and i'm gonna like do it for like my family and do it like with conviction and like do it my way mm. and i think it's like that's always been the case for me yeah um but like i yeah i guess and then when i was like 16 i got the opportunity to like compete against i got a wild card at the gold coast oh yeah and um I got to compete against Slater and Danny Wills in the first heat and like I ended up winning the heat and like I just remember like going out there like I felt like I had like my home like with me in the water like I'm just gonna like I don't know why I was so arrogant to think that like I was even gonna have any sort of chance but like it was just like well if Quicksilver believes in me like and I've got this opportunity like I'm not like squandering it like just gonna make it happen and I 
yeah, and I beat both of them at that age in that first world tour heat, like moment, all the people, and I just that's insane. And I just remember coming in and and giving my board to dad because like I had like some like requests to like do interviews and stuff, <laughs> and I was like, dad, just wait here, like with my board, and, and he just didn't move from the spot that I left him. And like all the like chaos that was going on, and then like twenty minutes later, I finally get back to him, and he hasn't moved. And I'm and there was just a moment. It's just like, shit, Dad. I think like I'm gonna do alright at this. Like this is I'm gonna do this. Like I'm gonna be a shortboarder. I'm gonna be a professional shortboarder, and I'm gonna <laughs> like make a career out of this. And if I can beat Kelly Slater and Danny Wills, like. Like I might do it, like I'm gonna do it right, and I'm gonna do it for like I'm gonna do it for us, and like and that sort of set me on that this journey, and like wow, and I had I no idea that's how it went down. Yeah, because you look on the outside, like I remember watching uh, what was the first movie that you did, Kelly yeah. Slater and the Young Guns. Nah, there was, what was your first movie? Oh, Scratching the Surface. Scratching the Surface. Yep. I remember seeing that. Super young. And it's just like, wow, full child prodigy, like yeah. freak status. So obviously like the talent was like child prodigy, but the upbringing that you had was the complete opposite to child prodigy. Yeah, absolutely. And I was 19 and 20 at 18 and 19 at that time of making that movie and like, at that stage like guys had already like started grinding away on the QS to make it for the CT and mm. like I was like coming off like the juniors which was under 18s in Australia and I only really did the juniors for like two years um and I wasn't super successful but I definitely had some success um but like I was like I'm not like it was still like getting my head around what I was like signing up for mm. sort of thing. I was like, I'm only 18. Like I'm not ready to go and like fly to Spain to surf an event in like some mediocre waves to then fly to Brazil for two more events to then fly here, like basically on my own and like try and get onto this world tour. Mm. It's like, I'm like, I'm, I, I can't, I'm not doing that. Like Is I'm that not scary ready. to think about. Super scary to think about. And I wasn't like a selfly like, um, motivated person to like do that to get onto the CT and especially at that time like there was these in incredible surfers like Ry Craig and Dane Reynolds and like they were just free surfing and like having incredible careers and like you know they were so inspiring and they inspired me massively and so I didn't compete for a year and a half like I'd, I I Quicksilver and Red Bull gave me the opportunity to go and make that movie really and like that no one's done that since then or like even thought about doing that now it's like if you're a decent if you got potential at 16 you're doing the qs like traveling the world like yeah. trying to get on the ct and like and, and is that good for a kid you reckon i don't think so no like for the longevity and like for the for the like i mean it's you, you got to go like to some pretty dark places to like deal with some of the losses you have when you're like so far from home and you get mm. to surf 30 minutes in some like close out beach break and you don't even get an opportunity to get a score and you get back then you get hassled by three other guys and you don't even get a chance to like stand up and then it's like oh and really so it's that bad oh and then like especially being young trying to cut your teeth in there too like then you got to pack your bags and and go across the world to another like third world country to like compete against even more savage like hungry competitors like 250 competitors like signing up to wow like you know battle it out like yeah i took i i had to take my time to do that and like i i had an incredible like transition from like that movie and then i got injured um i got injured at the end of the movie when I was meant to be starting the QS to then like try and get on the CT <coughs> I ended up um, dislocating, dislocating the um, 
perineal tendon on my ankle and I had to get surgery and end up being like a um like a five month injury damn um and like there was all this sort of pressure on me because like I got all this support from like Quicksilver and Red Bull and and Oakley to like make this movie and take this time out before I like went into the competitive side things which it was where I wanted to go to Mm. um but then I had this this final product of a movie which like I didn't get to where I wanted to like performance wise but like it had to come out and then like I had to focus on the QS but then like I spent almost six months on the sidelines and then which meant I started my first QS year like just short of halfway through the year Mm. and I flew to Sri Lanka for the first 6,000 QS event and I won the event and it was my first event back and it was like my first year doing the QS and then um was able to go from there and then I went by the time I got to Hawaii for the last two events in Hawaii I was sitting like 50 50 second and I needed to finish in the top 12 top top 12 and um I got second at the first one and third at the last one like the last two Hawaii ones I got second at Haleiwa and <coughs> third at Sunset and then Tommy Whitaker um lost in round three at Pipe and then I got the final spot on the world tour so I only spent six months on the QS oh, that's the dream ever yeah but like yeah I think like that um I have my brothers to thank for that I reckon really yeah just that like desire like that that hunger to like get to where I wanted to get to yeah. get to where I had to get to like and there was pressure to get there but like it felt like growing up trying to get to my brother's level to be like accepted to like hang with the cool kids it yeah. was like the same Especially thing like being so much older yeah being on the qs you want to get to the world, world tour, tour yeah. and it's like it's the same thing it's yeah. like there's this big hurdle to get up on top of and like this it's like the fear of not getting there was like so motivating that like i was able to use it to like make it happen as quick mm. as possible and i and i was able to do that but and so did you I can, from you saying about like wanting to do well, to look after your family and you come from humble beginnings, like, was that a big factor for you? Because for me, man, like we didn't grow up with much at all. Like I was the same, you know, I worked in a fucking video shop to buy my first dirt bike, you know, and it just, it, and it really bothered me from a young age to know that my parents couldn't afford it even though they wanted to it wasn't the case of my parents didn't want me to ride dirt bikes it was that they would fucking love that but we just don't have the money dude and there's two boys that wanted to race and and that like that fucking scarred me Mm. like that feeling of knowing how much that hurt my dad and now knowing that you know we ended up dream scenario of you know the way that everything's worked out like motocross is my career motocross is my life it's given me everything and it's the same for my brother and my whole like my whole career was around like being able to do the family dirt bike thing like Mm -hmm. i i started writing articles for stroke magazine at 17 Mm -hmm. in the hope that i could get a free bike and then i'd be able to get free gear and then we could just put money into like going to races as opposed to like paying for shit Mm -hmm. you know so it was like it was a scar that it left on me that fucking made me work dude like i Mm -hmm. hustled because i wanted it so bad and at that time too i thought i i thought i could be pro you know as a kid but you know you figure out that that's sort of not on the cards but that was a scar and it drove me and it sounds like that was a similar situation for you yeah a hundred percent um just the the want to make my family like just to see my family happy and like just taking care take the weight off and like the the like it was never i'm i mean my dad like he just worked 
you know, five, six days a week. Um, and we didn't get to see dad a whole lot. And then like the mail clubs on the weekend was epic because it was a family yeah. affair. Yeah. Um, but like mum never like, can't say we, we like missed out. Mum would never let us miss out. We like, were the same. You know, like yeah. we had the um, Toyota Space here with like three seats and like she man, she just like, you know, get us down to the Goldie or get us like up yeah. to the p- points at Noosa after school if we knew the, if like the way there was a cyclone swell going or she just get us get us there and no matter what um and never like made it about like money or mm. anything like that it was just like i think the opportunity to like do it not just for myself like mm. to like satisfy like to to make the ones that I loved the most that were closest to me like happy and mm. like to to give them like a like a freedom a freedom to like just to live in the house that we grew up in like it was just like the house we we just the house was in debt and like mm. you know the future was not certain and like it wasn't like it was a a convers what we we didn't talk about it but like we just knew and like it was just the way that like it was the only way like if I grew up and had like all the opportunity like given to me and like was super comfortable like I think I would always have been driven to like be good at things but whether or not i had the like a burning the, desire yeah to like put myself out there to like find my way to the top mm. like you can't like you can't look back and say yeah that would have just been like inherent like i would yeah. just like you know that's I was just destined to be here. Yeah. Like, I think in no way in the world was I just destined to be here. Like, I worked my fucking butt off yeah. to get here. I, I sacrificed to get here. Like, I, I've i wanted this. I wanted to make it happen. And, like, once you... Once I committed to, like, that being the only option, mm. that's what I made happen and like I mean yeah I don't know it's it's pretty fucking special it is I, I'm so incredibly it's special on both ends in the sense that they gave you this no pressure environment and there was no strings attached for you yeah. you obviously had this incredible talent and the potential obviously like you've realized that potential people would have known that potential quicksilver knew that potential red bull knew that potential and to be involved in a family that was in like a tough financial position like to have a professional surface son making millions of dollars that sure could make life easier but to then have no pressure for that to be the case and then for you to not have pressure to make that happen but voluntarily want to make that happen like that is quite a special situation yeah and i definitely like thank my my older brothers and and mum and dad for letting me do that mm. like make that decision on my own like i mean i love working with the kids now like i love like putting on kids event at cool yeah, and yeah. i like to like catch up with a small group of kids that have have um some serious potential on the coast and try and give them a little bit of coaching and just surf with them and mm. like give be, them a look at the possibilities and just yeah just share some insight and just have some fun with them and like i i just i, I really enjoy that um but like it's hard because i'm like what made me mm. like my makeup is just like 
be a kid make sure you be a kid because like once you get to the point where you're going to make the sacrifices like you got to understand that you're making those sacrifices yourself because mm. if they're not made by you you're going to get to a point where mm. like you might get so far but then like when that bridge breaks like the fall is severe mm. and like that's not going to feel like it's you falling it's going to feel like the weight of like everything everything is falling down on you and you're going to be the one responsible for picking up the pieces mm. for like those external influences and you can't get those years back and you can't get those years back and you can't get that smile back you know mm. like it's it, it's got to be like you can't be a kid again you can't be free and just you know mm. do as you wish go with the the sun and the tide and you know take a whole shitload of risk and like eat as much can't lollies as you want yeah. and fish and chips every day with your couple of bucks like yeah. you can't do that like once you decide that you're going to take the responsibility of like chasing your like dream or your like your vision yeah. of like giving back or like yeah. chasing it for yourself like you just don't get it back so yeah when i catch up with these 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 kids like they kind of like got the sponsorship already and they want to yeah like they see the social media of all the kids around the same age and like the comparisons and they got their filmers already and they that is crazy, like there's just huh? there's 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 so much expectation and there's and already like from 12 13 it's like oh he's not gonna go skating because like he might hurt himself and then like can't surf and like he's mm. already got it you know a sticker on his board and like can't have that in his life like you know i i never even went surfing before school i loved to sleep like i didn't <laughs> i didn't i didn't i never went surfing before school and then occasionally if the waves were pumping i'd get like the first like you know the morning shift off school and like yeah. sharp at recess and then like take it from there or like and then after school i'd come home and like more than 50 percent of the time i grabbed the shovel out of the garage and my bmx bike and went down the street and dug holes with dug jumps with my mates yeah. and then other times i'd go home grab my board jump on my skateboard skate down the front catch up like with my mates after school if the waves are average we skated if the waves look fun we surfed like zero pressure zero pressure zero shits given like it was just like what's going to make us happiest happiest at that moment, at that moment. Yeah. like so yeah it's it's really hard to like if you were going to like give advice to kids yeah. growing up to be like hey like this is what it looks like because space is limited now restriction is like there's a lot more of it especially being close to the coast you don't have mm. like bush and like ability to go and build your own bmx jumps and yeah. like you know i mean you can still skate to the beach and decide if you're gonna skate or surf but like it's it's harder for the kids like mm. i mean it's hard for the parents to keep the phones out of the kids hands which introduces them to like an ex a level of expectations worldwide instantly mm. like from so young like i didn't experience that until i was 14 and geordie smith and jeremy flores rocked up at the gold coast to a grommet event yeah at d bar and yeah. it was like whoa like mine was blown like wow you know but that wasn't detrimental to my career in any way like to be 14 and yeah, then like only yeah. just see that level and then yeah only see it for a couple of weeks and then they were gone again and then it was like back to you normal. spend yeah. a year thinking about fuck that was like so insane to see that like but i didn't like it didn't phase me yeah like i didn't go like oh i've got to get my boards like this i got to do this or whatever like it just I still just did what I was doing and then like once I got to the age where I had made a decision for myself to like 
try and be the best short water and be one of the best and and want to beat Geordie and Jeremy and these guys like then I made it happen like yeah. like Dane Reynolds is like my favorite surfer of all time like preach the most incredibly like I mean it's funny like he talented is just such a weird word because like talent is created over like obsession mm. to like and and want to be really really fucking good at something mm. you know like that creates then someone to go oh that person's talented but like they didn't just weren't born talented like it wasn't just like um you're destined to do this like dane reynolds was living in bakersfield california mm. nowhere near the beach 14 like ratted around on a skateboard a bit like just finally ended up at um ventura <coughs> found a surfboard started surfing fell in love with surfing and then like he's one of the guys that i've met in my career that like so in tune so obsessed mm. with like how like he like with surfing and what he appreciates and what he wants out of himself and like how like what gets him stoked and then like mm. what he wants to like bring to a certain wave and a canvas like he's like obsessive yeah. and like even his so surfboards in, that he rides to do it well now he yeah but like when he was like on this incredible trajectory from like 14 to 18 like 18 he was like andy and kelly were just going what in the world like dane reynolds he's the best in the world he's 18 just gets like went from rip curl to quicksilver and was on the big trips with andy and the boys and they're just going this kid is the best thing since sliced bread like are you kidding me That's heck, yeah. and then like another you know couple of years and he'd do one turn in a heat and get an 8.5 like no one can <laughs> do that so no yeah. one's ever done that before yeah. and no one's doing that today yeah. like yeah an air but like doing a turn on a six foot wave like at holly Eva and getting 8.5 like nobody's doing that but um and so you think he wasn't talented i think he was obsessed i mm. think he 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 had a tough tough time growing up not much opportunity found the ocean found a love for for that <coughs> and then he was he was gangly like kind of awkward like pretty shy like but just fell in love with the ocean and like how quickly he got extreme like from really good for over four years and then like i probably met him when he was about 21 on that first boat trip or 20 um he was just like so in tune like you sit out the back and wait for a wave like in the mentality he's like on the boat trip with like slater and freddie patasha and rye craig and dane would just be talking about a part of the wave and like how he's approaching it and like what he wants to do next time and how his board is feeling and then like what kind of stuff would he say about like a part of a wave that seems like what i've learned through jiu-jitsu <coughs> and now i've then gone and like applied the thinking to motocross and it's it's as clear to me in motocross as it is in jiu-jitsu and it's a something i've missed in motocross like my whole life yeah but there's like a meta of yeah. everything like every part of every uh every part of the experience whether it's like motocross or surfing or jiu-jitsu like you can get that obsessed and i always find it so interesting to hear about like like when you say he was talking about a part of a wave like what would he talk about like that because to get into that meta there's this level of understanding that you have to have like you can't just know that it's like a there's just levels you yeah. can't you can't know this until you know this and then to know that you've got to know this and this and this and this yeah i just find it so interesting to hear about like those kinds of details that you can only get through that obsession you're talking about yeah and i think everyone sort of 
appreciated that he was had like slated to mm. talks in a lot of detail about certain like waves and feels on boards and shapes and he goes forever Deep. yeah um but dane was like just like i don't know like he was doing like these like backside rail slide disaster slide things on like four foot waves at this one like wave on this, this first boat trip when i met him and like he was talking about like just you know like how hard he could go to set himself up to get into that position and then like you know i don't know but also like it was never enough too like he was mm. sort of like yeah like he just might have done like the, the most messed thing up you've thing seen. you've ever seen yeah. but like it was like yeah but you know like yeah. there's something else to it that could happen like there's more like he, you'd watch the clips back with him and you just like you know like just <laughs> your mind would be blown and you just want to high five him after like every wave that he caught when you're watching the footage but he just kind of like he would obsess on like Clay Marzo and Ry Craig yeah. and Slater because we were watching the footage back and like he would be trying to adapt like little bits of that like during the trip and like you know like he was I don't know he just like had an ability to like destroy a wave and like fit himself immerse himself into it that nobody else is done like there's there's definitely there was definitely a time there where like and he and he had this ability to be so unpredictable mm. at the same time as like knowing exactly what he was doing but like yeah he like in his mind never wanted to do the same thing twice so it was like made it so exciting to watch him mm. is that maybe what messed with his competition is that he couldn't just like he because he probably could have mailed it in a lot more maybe um and just like yeah, got, got the i think that's what everyone wanted him yeah, to do yeah but like you know he's not he's just not that guy nah and like he's yeah live by the sword die by the sword like this is his life and he he made it like he created the opportunity he created like what he had that people were talking about he owned that more than like anyone else and if he was like gonna blow a heat by going like for what he was like proud obsessing of, over proud of doing and wanted to showcase then he was okay with that and then like he only yeah had a short career and like he was happy with where he got to and had enough of the pressure and been told like how he needed to look like how mm. how he he needed to be perceived and stuff and it didn't he didn't like that and like and now he's still yeah still surfing and i mean i i would have loved to see him like continue to be on the tour and continue to showcase like what he was capable of because it was just like nothing that's ever i don't know i honestly think that's there's he has a place that nobody's been to that's insane like on a board eh? for sure like just a rawness and unpredictability and like you know you could say like when the waves were of consequence he wasn't as comfortable but like from like two foot to six foot like yeah he was um there was a time there where he was not touchable mm. like in any way like yeah i mean you watch like at the moment like john john you take him to like margaret's and like some of these heavy water waves like and he's got a real edge on everyone and like margaret's he's put on some like yeah, probably the most psycho, dominating yeah. performance that you could see in like our generation at the moment and like that is incredible but then like 
you like but then like in other locations like <coughs> it's it's not like that but there is like he he like in hawaii he has a real advantage as well like an ability to like and adapt to mm. the ocean over there and do th- special things that nobody else is doing but like dane could like in a wave that from you know two foot to six foot left or right like beach breaks like yeah. j bay whatever like it was like put your things down and just appreciate what's happening like there was a there was a few years there where it was like if andy and kelly are turning around going like yeah not like what are we going to do like unless he falls off we've got a chance like yeah um yeah he was one like and still is like he's even if he puts a clip out now like i the, the internet it gets me the most out. stoked yeah. yeah um do you reckon because when i really first started when i got into surfing like i grew up in cairns so i didn't surf at all until i moved to california and then i started surfing around like 2010 i think i started surfing and um yeah he was just the shit like he was the the guy that yeah like i remember following the tour and um and seeing like yeah the relationship that he had with like the tour and the media and the fans i wonder if let's say like peak dane reynolds in terms of like his ability um was put into today like maybe people would be more accepting maybe the industry would be more accepting or or maybe maybe that's just because like he become the case study of like what what can happen to a guy if you try to put someone in a box as hard as people tried to put him in a box i'd say there's less room for him now really yeah for sure it's like i think there was more room for characters back then like and and building that like and and having like room for that where now it's like if you if you really like were going to express yourself like it just wouldn't exist like it would be you know it'd be censored out it it, it's like there's been slowly sort of and and that like surfing is trying to get like as polished and in line with Mm. the tennis and the golf and like the production the camera the quality the editing the the packages the um the yeah the professionalism of it like that overall product the overall product and like getting it out there to to more people and is in the best place it's ever been um but but, that's coming at the cost of like legitimate characters and legitimate personality do you think um i think so i i think it is i think like there's yeah i would say that there's less room i think that there's less room for that now um and especially like to get to like even i think you lose a lot of characters i think when like training and like physical Mm. um demand comes up because like motocross yeah, yeah 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 so that takes I mean, Jason Anderson's probably one of the biggest characters and yeah. super cross, like he's yeah. got the most to say and but also can back it up with his speed and stuff. But like he goes against the grain of Supercross, doesn't have the best relationship there and he speaks openly about it. Like yeah. that's a really hard place to win and like to 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 be You gotta work hard to get to that place. And you gotta work really hard to sustain that. Mm. Like that takes a lot of energy. Um but that's true. I've never that's really just about his that. way, and that's 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 his way. Mm. Um, but like the tour, like it's just yeah, no one's partying anymore. Everyone's just head down, bum up, like training to get that edge on on the competitors and showing up and performing, and especially like right now we're surfing in some challenging conditions like Mm. with adapting the tour and and just making it work so like you're not 
showing up like a bit dusty to like Percy yeah. Walls or J Bay and like yeah. just put it on autopilot and just like two beautiful waves and like let your style and ability like do its thing and you know mm. you're gonna beat you're gonna make a, a fair few heats. Now it's like there's no room for that. Like if you don't show up with your best surfing, like you're going you're, you're packing your bag like straight wild away. Card. Yeah, it wild card so it's just like it, it limits like it's gone yeah from one extreme to like now it's like as professional as it ever has been but so this is kind of frustrating on my end and obviously not invested in surfing like i'm just literally a fan of you and fucking jack pretty much but it's like you look at the fastest growing sport in the world ufc they yeah. have the perfect production package they've got the social media is on point like they're delivering and i'd say the wsl is like on the it's in line with that there's no i wouldn't say that the ufc does anything better that the surfing does I, I reckon that the ufc probably has more people that are like myself that are just kind of outsiders that can make content and that content can actually like kind of have an influence I, mm-hmm. I don't know that surfing has much of that maybe uh, in the same way that the UFC does like a lot of ex-fighters have podcasts and YouTube channels and all you know that yeah. sort of shit yeah. but you know in terms of like the product it's very in line like it's a pr- perfectly presented package and the demand on the athletes is insane but the UFC mm. just lets it fucking fly yeah. like they don't care yeah. and they've profited from these very unique characters Yeah, and to me when you've got that and like even Dana White just being like fuck this fuck that fuck you yeah. fuck this cunt like yeah. just lets it go what's yeah. the repercussions yeah. they just sold for four billion dollars Yeah. so it's like to me now that model like that's that model's been proven as that, yeah. it, that it works and to me I'm like don't fucking hold anybody down anymore mm. let people be exactly who they are and who they want to be and like celebrate these people i just don't understand maybe the reason that the as i'm saying this maybe the reason the ufc can do it is because they make a lot of money off pay-per-view and they're not just relying on sponsors which is i'm assuming the wsl is in that position um but it's like dude people want to watch fucking characters yeah i think conor mcgregor is like very much responsible for a huge amount of that growth Mm. but even before that man like you got like the diaz brothers you got george st pierre you've got john jones you've like there was a he definitely penetrated the mainstream in a way that nobody ever could have yeah but that track was laid down by other people yeah but he yeah for sure and he like he had and still does have the draw of like the non-ufc fan Mm. you know like he like there's not i mean and yeah you're working with such a large pool of of talent and characters and like dog eat dog like that's like storytelling behind that and like the characters that pop up and walk yeah. and they have the ability and freedom to voice what they're going to voice from all walks of this world like of course mm. it's got so much bang like i think conor mcgregor i mean conor mcgregor i'm not a ufc fan mm. like i'm i just i don't watch it i'd i'd like it makes me uncomfortable to watch um but like i'll listen to conor mcgregor talk shit all day long i watch the ufc embedded yep. like fight hype like that like that is the ultimate testament to that yeah and like i'll watch a conor mcgregor fight and i'll actually like care if he gets destroyed or not like yeah. just and i like just by purely by like his like his character and like yeah. just his show and like you know and i don't know it's just i don't know i get i, I get stuck in it and um like 
I think probably with surfing, like the world champions, like Italo has character, yeah. like, and he's come on and he's like a, like so much energy, but like, that's not to say that he's going to sit down with like, and like talk up anything yeah. and like create hype around anything yeah. and like be a wordsmith in any way and like go and like grow WSL in some exponential way like just yeah. with his power of presence and the fact that he's the best at the moment um, and the guys are reserved like Medina Gabriel's pretty reserved like doesn't yeah. say a lot John John doesn't say much at all like they're not like voicing like they're not creating like any sort of conversation i guess yeah like for outside viewers to be like oh like this person's a character like yeah i'm gonna tune in and watch like he said he's gonna destroy like this wave and like destroy these surfers or like he's set up something and he's going to back himself in like that like it's just like yeah i don't know it's like it's not there in the same not, way no like slater has been an incredible like flag bearer for the surfing for yeah. for generations and like so much to so much respect for the way that he's been able to like represent surfing and yeah. and be so dominant but then like be so like relatable like he he can you know structure a really well like yeah done interview and yeah. like connect yeah. the dots and explain to people like how things are where they are and yeah. if anything sort of goes array like he sort of knows how to like handle yeah and mix being Mick's been amazing, like, for Australian surfing. Like, he's been an incredible representative and, like, speaks well and represents really well on, you know, the highest level. And, um, but, like, yeah, there's just such a limited amount of mm. surfers at that level that have that opportunity. Yeah. And, and then, you know, minimize, take that to, like, the top five that, yeah may really have a voice in some way to like generate new traffic and like the a lot of them are brazilian at the moment yeah at the moment and like surfing in brazil is probably the biggest it's ever been yeah but like for internationally but that like, doesn't extend out yeah no yeah so like yeah so yeah i want i wonder though how much of that is because of the it's like the wsl or the you know the tour just as slowly and slowly like molded and molded you've come it's like a systemic thing now it's like you come through the system and it's like okay from when you're like you said 12 13 14 because you could kind of see it in supercross man it was like the ryan dungy effect you know what I mean? There yeah. was like Dunge come through, one all that like Carmichael made people take training seriously, and then Dungey made every B class rider ever think that if they just dedicated themselves and spoke yeah. the right way, they could be champions. And then we kind of saw that play out for a while. And then yeah, like you said, Jason Anderson was like the first dude that kind of took that leap outside um, of that kind of zone. But man, before Dunge, it's like we had J Law. We had Josh Hansen. We had like Austin Stroop, Nico Izzy. Obviously, they had some, you know, they had sort of dramas and whatnot. Yeah. But before that, it was like um, MC, Emig, all the the boys. But it's like it just slowly gets corporatized and corporatized and corporatized yeah. down to the point where, yeah, you kind of look now, you look at the landscape and you're like, hmm, yeah, there's probably no one that can really pull this off. Yeah. But before it was like you know bruce irons andy irons you know sonny garcia you had these like big characters you could market yeah. the shit out of that stuff yeah yeah no most definitely and um it's yeah it's a little bit lost at the moment for mm. sure you could easily yeah say that but like 
you know, even with the guys that you were just referring to, like the landscape was different. Mm. Like you could let off a bit of steam, go have a couple of beers, no like media. show up with some character, like a yeah. bit of swag and like there was room for it. Mm. But now like everyone's taken their lickings and being kicked off the tour. Yeah. Like unless you are training, you are showing up, you are like spending your energy on got a coach like, got a filmer your equipment your your coach your yeah what you what you're working on showing up like the best surfing is happening in heats now free surfing is like what's free surfing anymore like really we just watched like over the last two events like gnarlier airs than we've seen in free surfing i don't know like you don't wait to see like you're seeing like the top level like some of the like the craziest airs just in a 30 minute heat and like and that's what john john loves doing like performing his best in heats and like the best surfing's happening on tour and like that is like indicative of like guys yeah. just going stuff that like i want to do my best surfing in a heat yeah. like yeah i want to celebrate my wins i want to like celebrate you know like cool off whenever like have my fun but like like they almost like i want to do my best surfing in a heat like mm. i want to do my best surfing when i'm in a heat against the, one of the best guys in the when world and you know everyone's like tuning in like mm. and the waves are challenging or the waves are pumping or you know the best barrel that you know it's just like there was so much more emphasis on free surfing and personality and character yeah. and like you know if you like were dane reynolds and you were this ex exceptionally good free surfer that like everyone just waited on the next clip but then like you dabble into like a wild card into an event and mm. be all this hype around oh we haven't seen dane for a while and then like goes out and just like destroys a few waves and gets two nines at the gold coast and like smashes Taj or Park, uh, Parko and like it's like there's so much like excitement and like there's like a real storyline he just knows that like all these good surfing is like in his back pocket and then he just goes and like sprinkles a bit of that on like top of the best guys like that's not happening anymore yeah like there's no there's not even almost happening anymore it's like you're not holding on to any footage like as a competitive surfer you barely even like I mean John John does a good job and i guess covid provided opportunity for free surfing clips to sort of come back yeah. a bit but like even still like the best surfing is happening in the contest and then i think like when that's the focus the characters Fall unless the there's wild cards yeah. coming in and like yeah. a mason ho and like a bit of a story happens around that but like they're not challenging like the top guys at the top level so there's not much weight that comes with it which mm. doesn't create any attention or hype yeah if that makes sense yeah it's no, like definitely so it's like yeah you might be a character but like even yeah i don't, I don't know but like jason anderson like worked with alden baker and won a championship was that like his quietest year that he's ever had on yeah on like this yeah he just knuckled down and got just it knuckled done. down and yeah. got it done like yeah. but there wasn't there obviously wasn't a lot of enjoyment there for him for sure and not sustainable for him yeah. it went against his character yeah and it wasn't him and, and then because and, he won he could kind of like write his own check to do what he wanted to do because he was like hey i've got you i've got that world title yeah and now it seems like he's still ha like wants to do it his own way as well like for sure but that takes a lot of energy yeah it takes like a big that's like a big risk as well dude the the biggest thing to happen in surfing was that shark attack at j bay like that's mm. like the biggest mainstream exposure that surfing's had in in so well name when ever. something bigger yeah ever yeah yeah it is yeah that was um yeah that was radical that <laughs> that is such a trip to think that you were even involved in that like that mustn't even have felt real at the time 
Nah, not at all. I was like in a final at J Bay with Mick and like Have it, you talked about this too much, by the way? Are you over it? Oh, it's not not going away. Yeah. And like it's no, I don't give a shit, really. Like, yeah, fair enough. Doesn't I was matter. Just, I was like, it doesn't. Hey, might be really over talking about this. It really does. It really like it's. It happened, and I'm and I'll never pretend it didn't. Like, and it's um, yeah. It's just a, a moment that's like the world. Like, yeah, everybody saw, um, and yeah ended up being like a good outcome yeah but like yeah i don't know it was probably like uh it was probably like if you say shit i don't know like if you were coming around first corner head to head with like a close friend for like in a in a race in a race of significance and like you watched your friend fall like on the down ramp of the first jump and you know the whole pack is coming and nobody else can do anything and you're the only one like it's already written in motion and you're the only one you feel like you're the only one that's seeing it happen Mm. and like you want to protect your friend like more than anything else it's like a it's like a yeah like a dream where you're like not moving when you want to get to something that yeah. needs yeah like you know you're like stuck like it's you're frozen um yeah it's yeah it's like it's, it's um yeah it's just a like a, a moment that you don't ever want to experience really but like don't know it's just an out of body experience and like it's hard like I don't know if um if I wasn't so like close with Mick and it was someone else like I can't say that like I would have just like first reaction was like mm. to go towards him to like try and do anything I possibly could to like try and help you yeah. know like I don't know maybe I, w- I would have maybe I wouldn't like can't answer that I have no idea and that to like to be in it and like react the way that I did and stuff it it has no um like there was no thought process to yeah. it it was just a reaction and it was just like a like watching a train wreck about to happen that's what that's the thing that i remember thinking when i saw it i was watching it live yeah. and um and i when it was all said and done and everyone was out of the water and everyone was safe i was just like fuck that's the world's most intense litman's test for julian wilson's like personality mm. i was like you you would want to you would want to know that you had that courage within yourself but mm. there's no way of legitimately testing it with yeah. that like you can't you can't build a fake test for like your courage mm. or your you know like who you cuz like you said there's no thinking that goes on in that moment yep. that's pure reaction yep. and there's like a fight or flight response and there's like there's no way you can legitimately test that without no. a great white shark about to eat your friend yeah yeah without that that surprise factor and there's no yeah yeah for sure but like i look at it like anyone else would have done the same thing Mm. and like if i was in that situation i mean it's that thing like treat others as you would you know want to be treated yourself as you want to be treated yourself and like that's just i think how i sort of live my life and like if I was in that situation and I would firmly feel like think that Mick would do the same thing for me but mm. you know who knows I don't know but like that's just how I sort of see things was, was there any like uh was there any hangover to that 
Oh, like for any sure. weird consequences that yeah, like any shit you had to go through mentally to uh, figure that whole deal out. Um, oh, like, I mean, I was in my, f- I was tight, tight, or I was like two hundred points back. I was like, it was real. You're right. It was title. pretty much tied with Adriano for the title at the time. I just won Fiji, uh, second at Fiji, and um, I was in another final and. Out of me and Mick, whoever won the final was going to be winning the the top, winning, um, leading the ratings at the time. Like going into the back half of the season, and um, to be honest, like it, like I'm a perspective person, like and value driven, like and like I was talking about before, just nothing would be more purposeful in my life than my family, and um. I don't know, put things in perspective for me. Like, obviously, I was in a super selfish place, like, mm. mentally, and it was working really well, but it takes... It's a selfish space to be in. Um, and it definitely put things in perspective for me in that moment. Um, and then there was a lot of ass, like, for, like, requests, like, people trying to, like... like media and hear, stuff. Trying to almost, like, hero what I did um in the moment and like that made me really uncomfortable because i was the last thing i wanted to do was feel like Mm. i was um celebrated in any way for my reaction because it was just a reaction and he was a friend and that's just what friends do for each other and like i just had his back and then like um it made me like yeah i wasn't comfortable like with the after effects of it and i I just wanted to play like the best support role I could for Mick like after it as well Mm. Um, and I just felt like that was my role to play from the moment it happened till like you know he was able to sort of like whenever he was good whenever he was good and like yeah like settled again Um, so yeah it it was a significant moment and like it was new to me to be like that like in that like um embedded in a world title race at the time mm. and be that close and you know if i was to win that heat i'd be leading the ratings and like it was in a great place and um that was a new experience and like that was like something that i was dealing with and then i think adding like a, a moment mm. that touched the whole world that then like was taking like trying to um take parts of me that i wasn't willing to give because i didn't believe that it was worth being celebrated in any way i was playing a support role to mick in all ways like from the moment it happened to after i didn't want to be yeah um separated from that yeah. like um so it made me uncomfortable but um it also was like it's all right like it's it's all right like you know i i I did i guess i did the right thing in the moment that's what my body did that's yeah that's what i chose to do but um i felt like in no way was that like an individual moment Mm. that needed to be recognized um and that's just the character. I don't know. That's just who I am. Yeah. So it made me uncomfortable. And um, man, that's such an impressive outlook to have. <clears throat> mm. Like it, so many people, I think would, you know, I guess even maybe subconsciously just leverage that moment. And yeah. you probably couldn't even really blame them. You know, I don't even think that you, you'd really look twice unless someone was going over the top with it. But yeah. You know, it's pretty pretty incredible that you've got such a humble perspective on the whole situation. Yeah, yeah, I I don't know. It like it is the way that I handled it and like how I felt like I needed to to handle it for sure. Um but was I bummed at the end of the year when like Adriano won the world title and you know, I was a long shot at pipe. Like, you know, maybe if I was a bit older or but i would have never experienced anything like that before it anyway yeah but like i don't know i think even if it happens tomorrow i still see it 
and and value it the same way like yeah. it's um was it hard to get in the water again it was i actually like um we had plans i was with my wife and I actually had a gnarly effect on my wife to be honest yeah, she's she, she used to love coming for a surf with me um and having a surf like you know semi-regularly and she can surf um but after j bay i think she surfed twice since yeah. like it rattled it's her. really rattled her like she was defense like she felt like she couldn't do anything like standing on the beach just watching it sort of yeah. happen and stuff and then she was like super worried about me going towards it yeah like what was happening and like it was all too much for her um which is fair enough but it's definitely a bummer that that it's it's impacted it's her, impacted her like comfort in the ocean and stuff for sure but um yeah I, we flew back to newcastle after j bay and that was what we had planned to do and like luckily there's no sharks there ever ah stocko's got none <laughs> um i didn't go in the surf i waited till i went back to the sunshine coast and yeah like my wife's dad was kind of trying to push for me to like get back out as soon as possible just to like get on top of it get and i was like no nah, i'm just wait till i get back to coolham and go out you know at coolham and like do it do it <laughs> you know where i where i grew up and sort of started there yeah. the, the crazy fuck the, the strangest thing was is we went to tahiti for the next event like six weeks later and like first free surf in tahiti me and mick are staying together and we surf at chobes like first surf and there's like never before uh, and never after but like there's just reef sharks like breaking the surface and like there's sharks around it was like, Dude, are you like, be over what it, is this, this shit? <laughs> what is this shit? Like never like, I mean, yeah, there's some, there's some tiger sharks and it's definitely sharks in Tahiti, but like, it's ne like, especially at it, at Chobes, at Chihopu, it's like never really an issue at all. A couple of the other breaks get sharky, but Yeah. It was like an afternoon session and the other people that were in the, out there too, there was a few other guys and we were, it, was, it was like a laughable moment. Dude, Mick was almost in one this weekend too, or this past weekend. Because that, that heat that, well, Jack's heat, yeah. they had the shark and everyone got on the skis and I think Mick was the next heat <laughs> after that. <laughs> Can you imagine uh, if Mick was in that heat? Oh, Fucking hell. Yeah. No, nah, yeah. heavy, heavy experience, obviously, to go through. and uh, But, yeah, pretty pretty impressive, obviously, like, your reaction. But, like you said, that's just natural. But mm. to even to have the – like, to take the position that you take on it now, it's so impressive. Mm. But I, get, I think, man, the thing that I've learned from this whole conversation is just the values that you've got, like, being super value-driven um, mm. and, you know, using those things to, like, guide the choices that you make in your life. For sure yeah um so when you retire how hard are you going to go into dirt bikes um you got any bucket lists you got any goals you got any visions let me know where you're at what are we going to make happen for julian Wilson <laughs> when, <you retire? laughs> when i retire because man we're going to do some I trips wanna, i'm sure dude i just want to do weekends away yeah. like just go and yeah do a couple just yeah just to do a weekend away like with the bikes and mates and like there'll be a bit of that happening for sure i think like when i retire from surfing i'll definitely like focus a bit more on improving my riding yeah you like, ride good by the way I've, for everybody listening i haven't addressed this julian wilson does ride good he's had a squid moment uh, around <laughs> me but i'm partially to blame for with that. a recluse clutch oh that was the biggest fucking dude i honestly <laughs> felt so bad you did i felt I was terrible i was the spastic on the bike no nah, but that was all my fault ah. because i kept it in first so I got, i've got the auto clutch in the 350 and then julian i'm like julian get on the 350 you gotta try this auto clutch it's so good you gotta get one for your bike and then julian steps on and uh you were doing like the hand warm-up thing right yeah the i had i had um sweaty hands and i put my hand no 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 <laughs> i didn't have sweaty hands i had foggy goggles and I grabbed the throttle with my left hand and put my goggles behind the pipe <laughs> to like clear my goggles 
and then it was in gear still, but like sitting but no in idle. Yeah. So yeah, and so um, I was doing a freaking wheelie with my left hand on the <laughs> throttle, like wild, dude. trying to grab the clutch with my right hand over the top of my left hand without dropping the bike, and then the bike obviously dropped, and it's like, yeah, obviously very beautiful looking brand new 350 <laughs> with some nice stuff on there oh i felt like an idiot nah i felt like the biggest dick in the world because oh. i i just well and i've thought about that now when i give people that bike because not many people really ride my bike that much yeah then i've I just now it's an instructional now bike. you just don't give it to anyone to ride no nah, i just put it i just put it in neutral like it should be yeah but so anyway julian wilson rides good and i feel like if you got the opportunity to ride consistently and uh, take that focus that you've got in surfing and put it into riding, I feel like you could get to a pretty solid level. It's club level. I'd love to do club days after. Cool and club day, you reckon? I'll be at cool and club days, definitely. 30. Oh, so, what? How old? What do you, when do you reckon you retire from surfing? How old do you think you'll be? I reckon I will be... I reckon I'll be 30... Between 36 and 39. Yeah. Oh, so you got a minute. I got a minute. I think I'm in a... I feel like I'm in the prime window to, like, make my goal happen of winning a world title. Yeah. I really felt like that last year. Yeah. Um, And then, like, didn't get the opportunity obviously with COVID and then there's been so much happen um, since that started last year to now. Yeah. And I'm sort of recalibrating because a whole bunch of stuff is getting thrown at me, mm. like scheduling wise and family sacrifice and um, event locations and stuff. And the Olympics yeah. obviously is, is still a real thing that's happening this year that I'm going to be a part of. So just um but yeah between 36 and 39 but i reckon i'll definitely get to yeah, probably 36 before yeah. i start so you're gonna be vets vets you you can win the vets championship at Coolum. i don't know really, i would not care about winning i just want to like i don't think i've done more than four laps at Coolum. dude that place is so gnarly if I like got to a place where I was riding a couple of times a week and then I was like doing a 15 minute moto at Coolum, I'd be like, yeah. That's pretty, that'd, like, be, that's, an, that'd be an achievement. That's G shit that'd if you be can huge. get to that level. Yeah. Do you enjoy training to where like you think that when you finish surfing, you'll keep training to, and like be fit for the moto or you reckon you'll just try and like ride yourself into shape? No way. I always will look after myself. Yeah. I value it too much. Yep. Yeah. I want to be... I want to be active. I want to be, I love doing too much fun shit. And yeah. like, especially the young family will be growing up and I want to, yeah, I want to be involved in everything. And like, yeah, I just want to have longevity doing fun shit. Yeah. No, I mean, I'm the same, eh? Like I would have thought to, I had this thing in my head where, um, I was like, Oh, I just want to be fit at 30. Like I've got to be in good shape at 30 because I just, for whatever reason, I just had in my head that where you're at, like if you were fat at 30, like if you had like a beer gut at 30 yeah. and that was it, it was over. Really? Like, yeah. I just, you're giving I, up on yourself from there. No, nah, I was just, that was my standard. I was like, I can't, yeah. I can't be not fit at 30, but now I'm going to be 33 this year. I'm definitely in the best shape I've ever been in. And I feel like every month I get in better and better shape, like obviously yeah. breaking your hip lot like that can slow shit down yeah so i took a bit of a hit there last year yeah but yeah man like i fully feel like i've got a few real good years left of being i sort of more think about in jiu-jitsu than motocross but i'm starting yeah. to really really enjoy motocross again yeah but yeah man like these are prime years eh? like yeah you, you between now and 36 is like that's some world title shit right there 100 percent, it is yeah and just enjoying the process of feeling good mm. and like doing hard work to make yourself feel good more often mm. is like a way to 
I think be your best self mm. like and that's gonna exist always like I don't see that not existing gotta f- gotta feed feed the beast I yeah. think and like even like I don't know like Greg Norman mm. like savage the guy's a weapon yeah, and like that's so true he's got he's just living like it from what it looks like such an impressive life still yeah. like so active and yeah. like just still playing golf and doing what he loves and like enjoying life like he's not slowing down he's never looking at like an age bracket or mm. something where he's going to slow down like yeah that's inspiring but i mean slater's he's he's getting you know he's gonna be 50 soon that's like, yeah yeah he's he's um like a very very unique human being yeah to be and he shows what's possible if you really commit to the level that he yeah if you make the ultimate 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 sacrifice to the to the sword to the to surfing like to yeah. to what you love and yeah he's made the ultimate sacrifice for sure the the other thing too that i've started thinking about and this is all just fucking shit you think about when you get older <laughs> is um that technology is going to improve yeah. massively in terms of like health and fitness so like i have in my head and this is something i think is like a good thing whether it's like fucking true or not but i'm like dude i need to keep my shit in as good a position as possible because at some point there's going to be crazy drugs there's going to be crazy <laughs> surgeries there's you know what i mean like there yeah, is you're gonna, gonna get be, but, new, new cartilage and yep but if you've just let yourself go like i would i'm so scared of being the dude that rocks up and they're like hey we've got this new technology we can do this but it's too late oh we're gonna scan your body oh you're a fat fuck uh, yeah. this won't work. <laughs> it's too late you yeah, let yourself go it's over bro you idiot. yeah you, you're two kilos over <laughs> yo, yo, <laughs> it's yeah. like a roller coaster thing where like you gotta yeah. be this high to ride this the ride ro- it's the- like you've got to be this healthy to get these treatments the robot says no yeah <laughs> <laughs> don't want to be that guy nah yeah for sure nah it's nah I mean yeah I I like riding a dirt bike is so physically taxing it's incredible like I don't know the challenge to like stay on your bike for longer like get better technique mm. where you can ride for longer like physically cardio wise like that would be fun yeah what do you feel what's like the hardest part of riding for you i don't ride consistently yeah and then like all the stuff that we talked about like risk um Mm. responsibility career where i'm at in my career and stuff like it takes it it actually like it takes a lot for me to get on the bike and back myself to get on the bike and go like just mm. have a go like you know you you trust yourself like you're not going to do anything stupid like you yeah. you're going to play the odds and like if shit goes wrong it's going to like it goes wrong and you you're going to take ownership of that um but like um i just hold on to the fucking thing like it's like <laughs> you know like nothing else like especially like I'll go for four months without having a ride or five months without having a ride to get home from being away. And it's just like, just death grip. can't hold on tight enough. Um, but if I can ride like once a week, I find I quickly get mm. like where I can get a lot more laps. Just in. More like confident. I'm almost like doubling my ride time within like, a couple of weeks of like maybe three rides yeah. by the third ride it's like okay like i've got my calluses i've got like yeah you know I've, i'm using my legs again which i've forgotten about and i'm like you know put my elbows up and i'm like you know not banging the gears i'm like sm- going smooth and like yeah. not trying to blow berms out and like think i'm like surfing on my bike or whatever it's like rain it in a bit and then like last longer i don't know i just got the new three 350 350 going the, the KCM 350 and that thing is a chariot I'm so stoked on it how many times have you ridden it two Fuck, 
that's not enough. Only two, and only because we got swamped out like so much rain, oh, like yeah. in the last month, yeah. like literally, like packing the bike up, heading for the track, getting oh, there, no. and like Skunk. not even seeing the track. But oh. I did ride Stockton Dunes, which was like the only. Oh yeah. You know when it yeah. pisses down rain, it's the only place you can go and ride. And that yeah. was epic. Who did you ride there so with? So cool. Did you uh, ride with Johnny then? No, I didn't. I just I rode with my. Um, just my brother-in-law Josh and Reese, um, my mate that owns the surf shop at Newcastle oh, and sick. good surfer and loves riding bikes and yeah, we just went out and ratted around, came across a couple of good riders. They sort of pointed us in the right direction sick. and yeah, it was pretty cool. Like I'm I'm a member at the Newcastle Golf Club and I, which is epic, really sickest golf course. Um, what do you shoot nowadays, by the way, when you play? I'm playing on five. Fuck. Yeah, it's the, he's nice with it. It's the lowest. It's that's the lowest it's been, and that was just like COVID. COVID like yeah. I was playing consistently. Are you geeking on that shit? When or I have you, the time, or are you just natural with that? Like you just kind of nah. go and play, or are you really working on it? I geek on it. Okay, but I don't like. It's the same as everything. Like yeah. it's not consistent. Like yeah. it's just. Um, I love doing it, but I won't make, I don't always make the time for it. But then when I do, like I'll sort of make it a bit of a, like that's my escape Thing, from surfing yeah. for a couple yeah. of months. Yeah. But um, I haven't been playing much lately. I yeah, took my clubs to Hawaii and then tore my hamstring at pipe and couldn't surf, couldn't golf, and then came back and just really focused. I've just been so focused on surfing. Mm. Um, and yeah, just been putting everything into that. So... Um, but yeah, Newcastle Golf Club is sick. It's awesome. But um, you always hear the bikes ripping around. Yeah. So I was finally riding the trails that go around the golf course and stuff, and like these sand rollers, like through the trees, and like some sick little like sand hill climbs through the oh, trees. It was epic. Sick. Yeah, I was. Did you have a paddle tire on or a sand nah, tire? No, nah, but a brand new tire, pretty much, because the okay. bike's fresh. Yeah. But like. Uh, yeah, I don't know what a sand tire would feel like. But Dude, we need to get you a sand tire happening. Is it night and day? <sighs> Crazy. Yeah. Like, we went and did that race in Rocky, and it's yeah. super sandy. It's That's probably one of the favorite tracks I've ever ridden in my whole life. Yeah. And, but it was sandy and rough. And so I was skitzing, dude. Like, I was looking... I actually ended up... Todd did practice starts, because it's like a concrete start there. Yeah. He did practice starts with a Maxa sand tire. And then took it off and like left it in his like pile of tires. Yeah. And have you been to Todd's workshop? No. Nah. Oh, so my studio is next to Todd's workshop. Okay. So I was packing, couldn't get a fucking tire. And I'm like stressing out. Like it was, MX Tour was sold out of these tires. And I was like, fuck, I cannot do this yeah. race without one. So yeah. I stole one off Todd. Yeah. And then I put it on that day. Sammy didn't put one on at all yeah. i was just like i was like dude you gotta get sand tire you gotta stand he's like nah mate i'll be sweet yeah. he did practice and then was like dude where can i get a sand tire like this bike doesn't even move really and we were just absolutely <laughs> blowing past him and uh so yeah the old sand tire man make the biggest difference so the there. sand tire is just like a full-blown paddle tire kind of it's or not like it a, a mix it's not like a crusty demon's yeah, paddle yeah, tire yeah. Yep. but it's like all the knobs are like curved like that oh and yeah, there's like yep. not much distance between them yep. so they can't fully have them as like a scoop tire they've still got to have knobs yeah but those knobs run in a line and uh, yeah, it's pretty much like a like a full scoop, but it makes right. the big. Even when you ride at Coolum, like yeah. it'd probably. I'm actually gonna try and get a spare set of wheels and just keep a sand tire on yeah. my rear, so that yeah. every time I ride Coolum, I can put on a sand tire. But I feel yeah. like Coolum's a little bit. It's got a bit of hard base to it as well, so you can kind of get away with it. But oh, yeah. it makes a big difference. Yeah, yeah. I've got to learn how to change my tire. No, you don't, mate. You got plenty of money. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck that shit. What are you talking Let about? Let me change my back tire. Nah, do do it. I'll. I want to. So what? you gotta have a spare. You gotta have a spare sprocket. Have a spare wheel. A spare wheel and sprocket. Yeah, ready just to go. Fucking just run it. You got. You and got too much money to change Then tires. you gotta get your um, your chain tension right. That's hard. <laughs> nah, you'll be sweet. <laughs> everything else, I like doing everything else, but I don't like changing tires. Okay. That stuff's shit. Okay. So, what's the plan for tomorrow? Can we ride? You reckon? Um, we'd have to go up to Newcastle. I'm totally fine with that. Yeah. What do you need me to do? 
Um, you got to call Chris Woods. At I love Chris. Great guy. <laughs> I can 100% do that. It says Julian's bike ready. Yeah, I can do that. All right. Let's and then what, what else do you need? Well, we just got to see what he says. Mm. I've got my... Where would we ride? Mm. Got any options? Yeah. Got options. Briggsy's house is always the first option. Oh, yeah. You were telling me about but that. But his eh? place got destroyed in all the floods too. Yeah. But we just went thirds in a posse track right before all the floods happened. Oh. So he's got a little posse track and he's got a tractor and he's been... I don't know if it's back ready. He, he just... He's got an enduro loop that's running at the moment and a rut track that he's running at the moment. But yeah. his proper motocross track has been a bit out of action, but it's, he's been working on it. It's probably back. I don't yeah. know if that track's free nuts. Is it? Uh, yeah. Is it good? It's sick, but like three of the jumps I can't do. Yeah. I don't fuck with those. That's fine. There's some some bangers there. Some like hundred and hundred and I think one of them's like 110 foot really like sort of like semi step uppy like you can't see the down ramp but it's a tabletop but like oh, if you case yeah, it yeah. you would get bounced and yeah like it's not that forgiving looking i don't know yeah. i don't even think about it to be yeah, honest it's but it's like <laughs> no nah, nah, i don't like hit jumps like you're a flightless bird i hit i do hit jumps i love hitting jumps but like once you get to like a, a whole lot of third and a, maybe <laughs> maybe a bit of fourth it's like yeah i'll not do that one leave that to axel i'll just i'll i'll, I'll leave that and i'll leave it to you nah. doing the triple mx farm that's a that's probably the easiest big jump in the world to hit though what gear do you do that one in um i've done that in second third and fourth second yeah Four. yeah you can do that i on, feel like if you do it in really high revs the bike is super erratic isn't it um like if you're like maxing out a gear when you hit a jump is that sketchy yeah I don't know. I feel it's like definitely sketchy. sketchy if you back off on the up ramp too. right like if you yeah i yeah. feel like it's just one of those things i feel like you can just learn to manage like yeah. what it, what it means but i'll pretty much hit that in third on the 350 pretty much like just a fair bit of third yeah i just hold i hold it like i land off the jump before and i hold it wide open and then right before the up ramp, I sort of like back off, like throttle check a little bit. Mm. And then I just give it smooth throttle up the mm. up ramp. And then there's there's times... It would feel nice. Fuck, it's so good. <laughs> <laughs> that, that jump, that jump's worth three hours. Like I had a conversation with um, the guys at MQ, uh, sorry, not, yeah, MAQ the other day. And we, they were like talking about the whole jumps thing. And they're like, oh, it's not safe to go this. And, and I was just like, dude, I drive three hours to just jump that jump yeah that's it i'll jump yeah. that jump fucking 50 times 100 times in a day yeah. and it's so worth the drive yeah. there's just that feeling oh and i i would not i'm not a very good jumper like that's that like i said that's the easiest big jump to hit is it but yeah. like oh man there that feeling i can see why people really get addicted to like big shit mm. and yeah there's <laughs> just there's something about that feeling man it's fucking so cool yeah 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 well i've kept you for a long time mate we've done thank you three and a half hours three and a half hours so i really appreciate it solid yeah i appreciate it i hope you enjoyed it i really enjoyed talking to you man mate it's my pleasure it's it's just love yeah i love this stuff and i'm a big fan of the the show and i I watch it all and love watching the motorbikes and um yeah, appreciate you having the time for me. No, no, no. Likewise, mate. And I um, appreciate the getting a ride together. And I love um, one of the cool things. I know it's not a mission of yours that you're not out here trying to fucking, you know, you got no objectives in it. But I think for me on a personal level, as someone that's invested in like growing the sport, um, I think like just you being as open as you are as like a fan and as, as like invested and... Um, as as a supporter in the way you are i actually think that you're doing like a really great service to this to the sport um and so for me i i genuinely appreciate the fact that you know and like you said you're like i'm just a surfer i don't know it's like it's still cool it's really cool to hear from somebody that is a competitor in the way that you are that's achieved the things that you have and 
to hear about like your perspective on the sport from the things that you've achieved i actually think you do more for the sport than what you'd think so just as a, a thank you for that as well oh thank you um yeah always will be a fan of the sport and if one day we can do like a super surf across event it would be pretty rad dude we're gonna make that happen in australia we should do that at Coolum. yeah two minutes from the beach we could definitely and the sand track's safe for kook surfers trying to ride dirt bikes dude uh <laughs> oh, we did this thing with jdr we did like uh the first time i ever surfed was because of surf across was I, it i never surfed in my life yeah and then i got invited to do surf across in the industry class i was working for jdr at the time yeah. and um and i went to huntington beach surf and sport yeah and i bought an old beat up almeric yeah. I just bought like a 6'2 short boy. I never had any fucking idea. And I bought That's the end. cheapest wetsuit I could find. That's ambitious. That's and I just went out the front of Huntington, like in the pier with a 3,000 surfers. It was like five foot. And just I just got fucking smoked, dude, over. I had no idea how to Holy surf. Holy shit. Yeah, I was fucking shitting myself too, dude. Like shitting myself. Yeah, the pier. If you get stuck in the pier with all the barnacles that's a freaking you get tangled up in that thing and drown yeah but like so people get oh, dude, it's dude, no. you're not just taking on like the fear of going surfing you've you've picked like a spot where the serious consequence <laughs> of getting it wrong i honestly didn't even think about yeah. that yeah i just was fucking shitting yeah, myself then, at paddling out even and then you get a gang hook in your back off a fisherman off the pier as well <laughs> <laughs> seagull shit everywhere yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah surf, nah. surf across dude that yep. was my first that was my first introduction to surfing and man i never thought cool. about that we 100 percent should do that cool. i'm I, fully in i reckon i'm gonna make it a statement that when kenny retires from racing i'll be able to get him to call him to, to do a do surf it. across event Julian Wilson and Ken Roxon surf Do across. Do surf across at Coolum. I feel like that's probably a team to beat. We should make that happen. Yeah. Dude, yeah. when would when would be like a good time for you to do that, you reckon? The schedule has been changing like so, yeah, so much lately. Yeah. Normally, normally I would say January, February is like a sure thing, but the schedule's changed now and it might be changed. Yeah. At the moment, it looks like it could be like a November, late October, November sort of thing. Is there any waves in November? There's always something. Always I mean, summer, yeah. if you're you going to do, if you're gonna do that either. event too, like don't make it competitive. No. Make it fun yeah. and make it like whatever type of board you need to ride to yeah. like go out and have some fun and have like your partner that you're with like yeah you know can i shotgun for a you? dance <laughs> um you go through the whole thing together yeah you know like the surf event it's teams like yeah. go out paddle out together like it's a it's a combination of the two of you like getting the yeah. scores of whatever sort and like same with the race you you know however many laps you can get as a as a barney to like yeah. the pro or if you have like i definitely like there is that many guys in Australia that can surf and, and can rip, rip a dirt bike. <laughs> yeah, like dude. there would be some gnarly Todd teams. Todd surfs pretty good. Yeah, Todd can surf. And I like I've had Todd surf. Dude, he's going to want you on his team for sure. I've had Todd. Fuck off, Todd. I've had him out like on my boards, like high performance boards. And like he can surf and like the waves are not easy. But like I know, well... Jilly would show him up. <laughs> yeah. Dude, Jill is committed. Man. Yeah. Like she, she would surf every single day. Yeah, I heard she's a burly local these days. Dude, she holding goes, it down. She goes out the back and be like, Yeah, Jill. She knows like every yeah. single person as she as she paddles out. It's so good. Yeah. Stoke for those guys, like their first baby and stuff. That's amazing. Yeah, and then Todd goes out, gets third at one thaggy and then wins the off road. G shit. Did they just have an off road after one thing? Yeah, the weekend after. And no he, way. He won, he won an the, off road. That's yeah. insane. He's doing the AORC and the the nationals. Wow, he's spending a lot of time with Benny Shadell up in the Glasshouse Mountains, eh? Yeah, <laughs> dude. He's always like, we knew um, 
like we'd go riding with Todd in in the hills at at his place and like he's a fucking psychopath yeah like there's some shit that he does trail riding and like ever since he was a grom yeah and i was just like i am not in any way shape or form prepared to think about doing what you just did yeah he looks he's he's natural man like he he's put so much time in that it looks natural like Mm -hmm. effortless and like he hauls ass he hauls ass at call him and like Dustin, I don't know. He loves. Did that. you watch him at the national last year, or were you not around? I wasn't around. No, nah, I missed. Like, yeah, I missed. Damn. Not last year, year before. Yeah, 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 sorry, yeah, year yeah, before. yeah. Nah, yeah, I've I got wasn't. a gap in my years. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Nah, I wasn't around. But I've been there to watch him several times. Like winning at Coolum. It wasn't always championships, but winning the final round or yeah. And um. Yeah, Gibbs is a legend too. Yeah. Such a legend. I mean, like, it's so funny in motocross, like, the guys who are, like, the gnarliest and, like, at the top of their sports, like, they are, like, have been some of the, like, most modest, like, down-to-earth, yeah, cool people I've ever met. And, like, I have so much respect for them. And, like, they don't talk about how fucking gnarly they are in any way but like you know that's the top of motocross but like i've also been to cool and track on a club day in c grade and had like some dude doing an air over my head on like one of the biggest tabletops that like no one else was jumping and i'm like what in the like go right in b grade or a grade like you don't have to show off like here like this is for kooks yeah like what are you doing like there's way too much risk involved here you could it can break my neck but um the guys at the t- top level at the top are just like they don't need to say anything about it no. they just know they're gnarly yeah and they've just been through so much to get there yeah and then i think too like there's a perspective with moto dudes like you just know they can be de- like taken away from you yeah like you said man like they are just exposed to so much risk yeah for dale <sighs> He's one of the most talented people I've ever seen ride a bike. And he's just, he's super down to earth. Yeah. Like, he's just a dad, just like, you know, I went for a ride with him just recently when I was up at home. And we were going to, you were going to ride that day too yeah, out yeah, of Kenilworth yeah. Yeah. with Daniel McCoy. And, um, and like, yeah, D- Dan McCoy, like, he's one of the most <sighs> inspirational people I've ever met in my life. Like, but like, the injuries that, go along with the commitment to like getting to the top of motocross is just like i have the most respect for the sport of any sport in the world Mm. like per per athlete per like yeah it's the gnarliest sport Mm. like it is that gnarly and sometimes for bugger all money Mm. like the commitment for the financial backing is like heavily outweighed but the passion and the the yeah you get that you get motocross in your blood and Mm. i think like you'll do crazy things but yeah man motocross is badass for it uh well we'll leave it at that we'll try and get this ride organized for tomorrow i would be so stoked i've had my 350 sitting underneath here just like (laughs) Chilling. On the back of the truck? No, nah, just chilling underneath. It's in the board storage? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> 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 Jack's like, you get a ride? I was like, fuck, I don't even know if I will. I've gone through so much effort. Just risk, Dude, the risk my bike being down there. Go and ride the island, man. We should try and see if they, they'll they let us on. I wouldn't ride the island because that would be like a three oh, and a half a hour too drive. Big? Yeah. But we could get to Briggsy's place in less than two hours. Yeah. Yeah, he said, yeah, I don't know. You going home tomorrow? I don't have to go home. I can, but it'd just be cool to go for a ride. Yeah, he was actually going to try and pick up my bike if it was ready because he had his Vortex or something that he needed to pick up from Chris. So I think that's, what day is it today? Tuesday. Tuesday, I think Thursday. But Wait, what day is it today? Yeah, it is Tuesday. Tuesday, yeah, Yeah. I think Thursday. But yeah, I've got the, I've got, I've got the week off, so... All right, let's do it. Thank you so much, dude. And uh, pleasure. Let's let's do this again when, when it, literally whenever you want. <laughs> yes, o- <sorry>. Open invite. <laughs> we'll watch a supercross together. Done. I would love that. Sweet. <laughs> Cheers, bro. Thanks, mate. Cheers. 
If you enjoyed this content, please like and subscribe. And to listen to the full three-hour podcast, search Gypsy Tales in your favorite podcast platform or click the link in the description below. Gypsy Gang.